please see Bud here in the red shirt and fill out a blue sheet. It will be forwarded to me. That way we can make sure that we get you on the agenda. If you would also include uh, the subject matter or the agenda item that you wish to address, we'll put you on during that session. We'll have a call to the public at the end of the day also. Um, if you would please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, so our first uh, item is the approval of our last commission meeting, meeting minutes. I assume everybody's had the opportunity to review those. Can I have a motion? We'll move. Pete moves. Seconded. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Okay. Director Talbot. Mr. President, members of the commission, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I'll try to make the uh, director's report uh, fairly succinct. Uh, we have had a lot going on, and there are several issues that I would like to visit with you about, including I would like to have uh, Brian come up and, and visit with you for just a moment about where we're at as we move forward uh, with the grizzly bear uh, process in, in the state of Wyoming. As you're well aware, uh, there has been a lot of discussions on uh, that issue as well as the captive raising of, of sage grouse with the governor's office. And, and uh, this report goes back to July, so I will report very briefly on uh, the commission meeting in, in August where all we did was, was that particular agenda item. From a legislative perspective, we have been uh, uh, busy as well. And there are, are three bills that will be moving out of Travel, Recreation, and Wildlife, that is a sensitive wildlife information uh, research data bill, and that bill will allow uh, the commission and the department to hold some sensitive data back. Uh, please recall that under the uh, Administrative Procedures Act currently that uh, all information that the department and the commission have, uh, with very few exceptions, personnel, active law enforcement reports, and a, and a few other items that are exclusively uh, forbidden as per statute are available to the public and, and we get some uh, requests that we clearly don't think that are in the interest of wildlife or the agency and currently in order to withhold that information we have to go to the district court to get a court order to withhold that information so uh, that bill could save us uh, quite a bit of administrative time in, in the future. Uh, the sale of uh, location information as you're aware, there are individuals who on the internet are selling the location of, of particularly trophy mule deer, and uh, that bill uh, is in an attempt to uh, prohibit that activity. There has been uh, a request from the Wyoming Women's Foundation for antelope licenses. That was a bill from last year that, that failed in the legislature, but TRW is looking at that. That bill has... Uh, uh, let's say uh, um, uh, generated significant <coughs> debate about set aside licenses in, in this state. So uh, uh, the, the TRW will be moving forward with that. And at the last meeting, uh, we were presented by a, a bill. It's not a committee bill, but it is a, a, a TRW interim study on MOUs. We have reported to TRW uh, uh, several times on. Uh, agreements that we have with particular the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on, on wolves and grizzly bears and uh, Representative Steinmetz has presented a bill for the committee's consideration. They will consider that at their November meeting, but that bill would require legislative oversight of any agreement that the commission enters into with uh, particularly the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So. Uh, uh, again, the, the committee did not debate that bill, but that's an individually sponsored bill at this time, and they will uh, <coughs> consider that at their uh, um, 
November meeting. Uh, we have approached the Commission a couple of times on a public outreach process and uh, we have entered into a contract with Commission approval for responsive management. <coughs> and, uh, recall when the Governor's um, Task Force on Funding met, uh, their first question for us or one of their main questions for us is, is the Department and the Commission spending the dollars that they have uh, effectively? And recall that we had WMI come in and do a program review of 12 of the programs that that, that task force wanted to review. Those programs range from fish hatcheries to employee housing to our vehicle policy. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to report that we passed that program review with flying colors. The next question was asked is, where does the department and the commission want to go? And uh, uh, in the 90s, we went out and did a, an extensive public input process as the public where they wanted uh, us to move forward. There were a few areas. Uh, our access program, which has been very popular, was one of the er uh, uh, areas of emphasis from the public. And so uh, uh, it's been 20 years since we've done that, and uh, we're in the process of doing that. Commissioner Culver joined uh, staff and I uh, with uh, representatives from responsive management this past week, and we spent two days uh, kind of trying to lay out a roadmap of how we are going to engage the public, um, the types of, of questions and, and the areas that we want to look at with the public and, and moving that forward. So I'm excited about that process. Uh, it'll take several months to get through it, but uh, uh, every, literally every man, woman, and child in the state will have the opportunity to provide input to this commission on where they want to see this commission go in 10 years. So uh, it's a great opportunity, and, and I look uh, forward to that very much. Since our last meeting, uh, everyone knows that the eclipse came through the state of Wyoming. That was a fairly major issue for the department, and, and I would like to offer uh, my thanks and, and extreme gratitude to all the individuals in the agency that were involved in that. Um, I'm not sure how many folks were actually in the state during that time, but the estimates are anywhere from uh, half a million to a million and a half folks uh, came here. Those of uh, you who tried to drive on a highway that afternoon know that uh, uh, it was about an 11-hour drive from Casper to Denver. Uh, lots of folks visited. We had a lot of resource concerns. We had a lot of concerns about uh, boating safety on the waters. We had concerns about uh, fishing. We had concerns about folks camping on our units, particularly fires on our units. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to report to you that uh, we had a core group of folks that worked on that all the way from the Nebraska border to the Idaho border. Uh, they, they represented the department in an exemplary manner, and I would like to, to thank them. They reported that most of the folks that were here to see the eclipse not only uh, enjoyed our department and commission-owned lands, but left them in better shape than they found them in. And uh, that was certainly a, a great relief to us. But I would like to, to personally thank Mike Choma, and Mark Nelson uh, on behalf of the department. Those two individuals really stepped up uh, as far as the coordination efforts and helped uh, make that uh, solar eclipse a very positive issue, not only for the department, but uh, for the public that was here to visit. Um, myself and uh, Deputy Director Scott Smith met with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the uh, regional administration from the U.S. Forest Service to try to move uh, uh, the issues in the Thunder Basin National Grasslands forward. Uh, there has been and, and remains significant controversy over prairie dog management uh, with the hopes of someday introducing black-footed ferrets into that part of the world. And, and the department uh, has taken a stance that until issues can be resolved with plague and also uh, issues uh, regarding uh, uh, public relations and that portion of the state of Wyoming that we are not interested uh, whatsoever in, in moving forward with any efforts to uh, reintroduce ferrets into the Thunder uh, Basin uh, National Grasslands. Every year, uh, uh, Safari Club International asks the Western directors to come to uh, Las Vegas to present a program to their membership. And last year at that uh, uh, presentation, uh, the idea was hatched that all of the directors uh, and AFWA leadership 
uh, come to Wyoming and sit down and, and talk about issues with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, issues where uh, we as state directors could be more <coughs> effective. Uh, that meeting did take place. It was at, at the Granite Creek facility, just south of Jackson, and, and uh, I participated in that. Uh, that was a very good discussion, and, and hopefully we can move uh, forward on many of the issues uh, after that. Uh, at the uh, at the July commission meeting in uh, uh, Afton, uh, the local radio station there asked uh, on the, mor the second morning of the meeting if I could come down and visit with them. And uh, the DJ's name there is Mr. Duke Dance, and he appreciated that, and the community appreciated that. And, and so now we're doing a monthly radio show uh, in the Afton Valley, uh, and uh, I've enjoyed that uh, very much. Uh, in addition to that, I, I had the opportunity to speak to several groups with the AFL, CIO, and, and others. But I think a, another issue that I'd like to share with the commission, and I know that you've received some, some emails on it, is, is where we're at with chronic wasting disease. And recall that uh, several of the commissioners, namely Commissioner Crank, certainly urged the uh, department to be more engaged with uh, uh, chronic wasting disease. Uh, as uh, uh, an agency and then also currently I serve as the chairman of the National Fish and Wildlife Health Initiative between uh, the department, the AFWA Health Committee and, and the initiative. We uh, submitted a, a NCN, a, a National Conservation Need proposal and received $100,000 to move forward with Dr. Mary Wood and Dr. Mike Miller's uh, chronic wasting disease proposal. But there's been a lot uh, that's happened, and I, I provided you a handout. And um, uh, this handout was put together in coordination with the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Health Initiative and the crew from, from OFWA. But there's a lot of changes going on with uh, CWD. Uh, and, and those highlights on there is that those, those uh, prions uh, can be very persistent in the soil, and they can be uh, taken from the soil and uh, transposed into uh, uh, vegetable matter above the, the soil. And so that is very concerning, uh, specifically with, with gramoids and, and wheat um, grass and, and those types of plants. Uh, swine, there's some research that's coming out on uh, swine uh, pose a, a significant risk for transmission of CWD. And, Probably the most concerning is that um, the recent study that has not been completed yet but is ongoing indicates that uh, uh, primates, macaques, which are a small monkey, can develop CWD from the ingestion of chronic uh, wasting disease infected meat. And so uh, recall that in the past we have depended on uh, language in our regulation from the World Health Organization and uh, the Center for Disease Control and, and CDC has come out on their website with some very strong language on uh, uh, testing of uh, chronic wasting disease of potentially affected animals and uh, that for human consumption. Uh, we're in the process of changing our website, uh, but uh, uh, we will be engaged in that. Uh, uh, AFWA has asked all of the 50 states to look at their surveillance, CDC, has uh, strongly encouraged uh, all states to look for chronic wasting disease. And uh, um, I would say that none of the recent research findings are, are positive from, from our perspective. And, and chronic wasting disease is certainly something that we need to uh, uh, keep a very, very close eye on as, as we move forward. So with that, that is, is my report, Mr. President. I would answer any questions from the commission. And then when uh, I'm done, I'd ask Brian to come up and give a, a quick update on the grizzly bear process. Any questions? Scott, I've got one question for you. At our last, uh, I think it was at our July meeting, we discussed the transfer of some cow elk from a facility in Fort Collins to our Thorne Williams facility for CWD research. Has that transfer taken place? Mr. President, I, I would ask Wildlife Division on that. I don't know that it has at this point. It's not going to go forward. Thank you. 
Any other questions for Scott? Thank you. Scott, oh, um, so you, you were able to obtain $100,000 in national funding for Mary's um, and others C, CWD research? Mr. President, Commissioner Crank, that's correct. Great job. And, and it's been about a year since we kind of started our new CWD program. Is it, would one of you um, touch base with Mary Wood and see if it's time for her to come back and kind of give us an update? in the next meeting or in the in the several meetings mr the president commissioner i think that that with uh, certainly with the the new research that's uh, coming up it would be very appropriate to have a, a very uh, thorough discussion and presentation for the commission on chronic wasting disease and and we'll put that on uh, for the next commission meeting thank you thank you pete uh, mr director so uh, for clarification will this information be updated on the on the, our current website the new findings on CWD. Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Doobie, I've already visited with Rennie about that, and, and we're in the process of updating our website right now to reflect the new uh, uh, recommendations from the Center for Disease Control. Thank you. Thanks. Brian? Thank you, Mr. President, Director Talbot, members of the Commission. Um, I've, I've been asked by several, and so I thought I would provide a, a quick update this morning on kind of where we're at with with um, where we're going to go with grizzly bear management down the road as, as all of you know um, as of July 31st um, grizzly bears were officially delisted um, which really put into motion the um, grizzly bears falling under the um, game and fish Commission approved grizzly bear management plan and so now um, bears are managed under under that plan under all of your your plan um, I convened um, a couple of different meetings internally with our folks to kind of talk about what um, what we need to look at going forward and we got uh, we got in a short period of time some exceptional uh, feedback from our field personnel and and I think um, have some good information to kind of get started with developing some eventually some proposals and recommendations that we bring here to the Commission um, there are multiple components of the grizzly bear management plan anywhere from you know how we deal with conflicts um, to how we collect information and monitor grizzly bear populations to ensure that we continue to have recovered populations and also hunting is contemplated in the, um, the Commission's grizzly bear management plan. And so um, our next step really um, over the next two months through about the end of November, first part of December, we will be engaging some of the key um, organizations and stakeholders that are interested in grizzly bear management as well as conducting some we're going to call them scoping meetings with the public um, and really what the uh, what these meetings with the public are going to um, be intended to accomplish is just provide general feedback to the department on how the public wants us um, to manage their their grizzly bears um, in accordance with the Commission's uh, grizzly bear management plan um, it's not going to we're not going to go to the public with proposals we're not going to go to the public with a, a regulation we're going to go to them and ask them um, for their input on all components of grizzly bear management, all of those that you know that I just talked about here, um, not just hunting, but but all all components of grizzly bear management. Following that, um, our intent is is to come to the commission with a proposal with changes to the regulation um, this coming winter, um, and and it'll probably mirror the the uh, season setting process that 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 the commission um, undergoes every year, and so. Um, I, I expect that you will see a proposal as far as changes to regulation that will that will have two sets of public input um, by the March time frame March to April time frame um, really that's it um, I but I did want to make sure that um, all of you are up to speed with, with where we're at and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have questions for Brian Thank you. One other quick thing, Mr. President, I wanted to tack on to um, something Director Talbot talked about with the Eclipse. And we did compile a lot of um, interesting information. And um, it was, a, like you said, a pretty large department effort. And our intent is just to come and do an informational presentation to the Commission, I think, at the November meeting to kind of give you a summary of, of how all that went. OK. Um, and before we move, I believe you're up for the next agenda item too, Brian. But before we move on to that, one quick point of clarifications on the minutes that we approved this morning. Those were the minutes, those minutes 
that we reviewed and approved this morning were from the July meeting, the minutes from the August meeting, which was the special meeting for chapter 40 and to finalize chapter 40 and 60 will be approved at, I assume the November meeting, if I'm correct. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Brian. We can move to number th or agenda item three now. All right. Well, I uh, I have the distinct honor and privilege this morning to uh, to recognize Mr. Brad Hovengay for 25 years of service. I'd ask Brad to come on up. So all of you got to uh, if you didn't know him before, you got to meet him this morning um, when he talked to all of you about some important issues in Jackson. But uh, Brad currently serves as our Jackson Regional Wildlife Supervisor, and one of the things that we talked about this morning is is uh, is um, the best and brightest that we have amongst uh, our employees in the agency. And today, um, we are recognizing uh, 25 years of service um, for one of our best and our brightest. I can say that unequivocally, and um, based, based not only on his current performance, but on his entire um, track record and proven performance with the department. He, uh, he spent a lot of years. He started out his first game warden district, was, uh, was in Big Piney, and he spent a lot of years there. He was um, quickly known in Big Piney as a, a tremendous ambassador for the department with the landowner community. Um, he was there at a time when there were some significant challenges with uh, big game damage and with feed ground issues and with um, the, the first kind of the, the front end of large carnivores coming to that part of, the, um, that part of Wyoming. And, um, and he was also known for being a, uh, a a heck of a game warden when it came to law enforcement, he was charged along with his teammates there um, with protecting some of the most coveted mule deer resources in the state, and uh, very vulnerable mule deer resources. Um, many of you have heard about Popeye. Well, Popeye spent some of his time in Brad's game warden district when he was in in Big Piney, and and um, and Brad made some exceptional uh, law enforcement cases when he was there. Um, he moved to Lander and spent a uh, significant amount of time in Lander as the game warden there. Um, dealt with some new issues there and, and, and just continued to do an exceptional job. One of the things that Brad is known for within the agency is he was kind of the first one to um, start uh, a, a little program called Coffee with a Warden. And uh, it was extremely popular in Lander and it continues to this day because of Brad's efforts there in the beginning. And, um, and I think that really reflects Brad's value for relationships between department field personnel and the public of the state of Wyoming. Um, because he has um, such an exceptional employee and he's done such an exceptional job, we promoted him and sent him to, to Jackson. Um, for, by all reports and talking to Brad, he's, he's still glad that we sent him there, although there's been some challenging days for sure for him. but. Um, but yeah, he, he continues to serve and just do an exceptional job as our Jackson Regional Wildlife Supervisor. You will see more of Brad in the future, and um, I'd like to congratulate him. All right, Mr. President, next um, on the agenda is, is some more recognition for um, one of our exceptional young game wardens, actually the, the, uh, one of the two game wardens here in Gillette. And um, we have with us today Casey Dickinson, the president of the Wyoming State Chapter of the National Wild Turkey Federation, who is going to 
uh, make this presentation for the National Wild Turkey Federation Officer of the Year. And I would ask both of those gentlemen to come on up. I'll turn it over to, to Casey to kind of kick this off, and, and I'll fill in behind him. So. Every year we look for an officer, the law enforcement officer that excels in game and fish. Uh, evidently turkeys mostly. <laughs> uh, and we came up, Dustin was nominated and we went through, seen no reason why he couldn't win our officer of the year. Uh, He's also in contention for the National Officer of the Year, uh, which that'll be held in Nashville. If he's selected, then he gets to go there and receive the National Award for Officer of the Year. I think he's done an exemplary job, and I think Game and Fish should be proud of him. We don't have a fancy certificate today. We had a custom turkey call made for him with a plaque oh, and it was so good the post office decided they'd keep it an extra day or two. I just want to comment on Dustin's award. First of all, uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, thank you so much for sponsoring that award. You continue to be a valuable partner to the agency. And Dustin, your uh, reputation precedes you. I, I have heard numerous testimonies to the good work you have done and continue to do, and we thank you for that. Tristana, you're up next. Thank you. Um, this morning, I get the honor of introducing Rick, Rick Rothlutner. That's not enough, Rick. Um, every year, um, both on a state and a national level, I hear conversations about how can we provide opportunities for hunter education students to continue developing their skills after they leave their classroom. And Rick has developed a program. We just celebrated the 10th anniversary here in Wyoming. Um, but it absolutely speaks to the ability of developing our youth hunters before they actually get out in the field or while they're out in the field. Um, the Wyoming Youth Hunter Education Challenge is now held in Upton, um, so right around the corner. Um, but through Rick and his dedication, he has built a team of incredible volunteers that put this on. Um, the youth that participate have phenomenal opportunities to continue developing both um, skills with their rifles, archery equipment, muzzle loaders, um, as well as their knowledge about hunting laws, um, ethics, and responsibility, and then they put them to a challenge every year, um, both here in the state and then annually Rick takes a team to the national competition, either in Pennsylvania or in Raton, New Mexico. Um, and I think the number of students that are here today that their parents let them come, to come out of class and come to meet you guys definitely speaks to the team that Rick has built. So I will let Rick talk more about the program, but thank you and thank you for partnering with us. Rick, welcome. Thank you. Um, it has been 10 years. It's been a good partnership with the Game and Fish. Um, we started it with Jim and Brady, and I think I saw Becky walk in. Um, and then we just built it from there. Um, we do have a lot of volunteers. They come from all over the state, they come from Missouri even. Um, and that, But the big thing is the kids. And they, they put a lot of work. There's eight events in each, eight events in the state event and eight events in the national event. Um, 
So that's it's not like going to basketball team basketball tournament and throwing up basketball, which is hard. But they got to do eight different disciplines. Um, and we just had our tenth year, and we did. Brady designed some pins. Riley and Eli had some pins. We'd like to give you guys. We made them for all the contestants, and we'd like to pass them out to you. Ten our ten year anniversary pin. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we need to introduce the, the kids. Um, we had 11 kids go to nationals this year. Um, three different teams, and they let me be a coach, which is fun and humiliating. Because you participate, and you get beat by the kids. And um, My team consisted of Adam Christensen, which he's not here, Riley Coburn from Upton, and Bree Miller from Wheatland. Um, then we'll let Nick, Coach Nick White introduce his Upton Young Gun Junior team. And Brady Morris with his Upton Young Gun Senior team. So unfortunately, three of my members cannot be here today. Uh, Stal Thurston from Jackson, um, I had uh, Kaylee Johnston from Upton, and Aaron Strandlin from Riverton cannot make it. But I do have Eli Jones and Avery Allathouse here today as well. Welcome. And then um, Nationals is a huge event. 350 kids participated. Fifteen states, Brady. Um, and they're all outdoor-minded kids, um, just like these kids. And we had a couple individuals. We had Adam Christensen actually placed second in the Cherokee run, which um, consists of tomahawk throw, spear throwing, fire building. It's kind of a fun event. Um, he placed second by just a few mere seconds. He would have been first. And Trevin White, he placed fourth and he just got beat by a few seconds. Um, our highest finish, I believe Eli was 25th in shotgun. Um, but we came away, they have like two big awards and Wyoming came away with one of them and it was a sportsmanship award and they awarded it to the state of Wyoming. Um, it was the third year in five years that Wyoming's been awarded that sportsmanship award. Um, and it's, it's a very big, big deal, these kids did um, tremendous. Um, some of the um, events, they were disappointed in their events, but they still smiled, they laughed, they shook hands, they talked to people, um, they helped out people. We had, I had volunteers come up to me afterwards and saying, what a nice bunch of kids, the Wyoming kids were. They were always saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, thanking them. Um, and it shows their sportsmanship and their ethics out in the field. Um, and and that's what, did you want to see any more on that, Brady? Um, but I would like to thank the kids. Um, they did a very good job. I'd like to thank the Game and Fish. Um, we started this 10 years ago, Jim. Jim and Brady and I started it, um, and it hasn't missed a beat. Tristan has come in and done a huge job. Um, Mr. Jeff Obrick is always really helpful. Um, is there any questions, Mr. President? Rick, I just want to say thank you to you for all the work you do on this, and thanks to the individual coaches, and congratulations to the to the kids on, especially on that sportsmanship award. Three out of five years, that's that's outstanding. Mr. Any questions? President, yes, Pat. I'd like to give these kids and coaches and everybody involved a standing ovation, if we could. Agreed. I'd also like to thank um, the, um, Keith for Commissioner's Tag for the Upton Gun Club, which that helps put on the YHEC, and Mr. Doobie for the Commissioner's Tag for State YHEC. That gives us an opportunity to buy equipment that we haven't, we've been getting by without. Um, and that, that really helped. 
um, and it'll help in years to come because that, that equipment will stay there forever. Um, I'd really like to thank you guys both for that. You're welcome. Any other questions? Nope, let's get you up here for a picture. <laughs> get up. This is cool. Good job. Yeah, at least. I'll hide in the back. Our next presenter is Casey Dickinson. Casey, come on back up. <laughs> Every year we're provided the opportunity to hunt private property and it, it's enjoyed by a lot of people probably more than you'll ever know and with national wild turkey federation we feel a privilege to help continue that tradition through the access yes program and we have a check here for the game and fish so scott and president culver you guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, Scott, you want to put that in your wallet, then? <laughs> Mr. President, if I may, for just a, a quick moment, uh, certainly appreciate uh, all of our partners, and the National Wild Turkey Federation has been an incredible partner. I talked uh, uh, for a moment earlier about public input and, and our Access Yes program. That was a program that was suggested to us by uh, the public, and we initiated that. Uh, back in <clears throat> the late 90s and and really started moving that forward in the early 2000s but uh, it's groups like the National Wild Turkey Federation uh, we also have some other partners up here in this portion of the state the Sheridan Johnson County Pheasants Forever but thank you very very much uh, those contributions go a long ways to providing opportunities for youth and, and everybody hunting and fishing thanks again and uh, our next presenter is Doug Carlton. <coughs> Doug, welcome. I'm Brian Kerbin. Oh, Brian. Good to be here. I'm from Sheridan, part of the Johnson County, Sheridan County 
presence forever, Mrs. Jim Lyon, Welcome our banquet chairman. Uh, today, we'd like to make a presentation to the Access Yes program of $5,000. Previously this spring, we gave <laughs> $7,500. And we're committed to giving unrestricted donations to Access Yes. It's something that our chapter members really want us to uh, participate in, and we're very pleased to do so today. We'd also like to offer a pledge if anyone would want to match our $5,000 today, we'd give an additional $5,000. So thank you, Mr. President. We appreciate it. Thank you, Scott, and all the commissioners. How long does that offer stand? Uh, and there's no end, no end date. We will work towards that. Mr. President, members of the commission, uh, this is a perfect example of a little engine that could. This is a very, very small group of incredibly dedicated people. And, and I don't know, uh, over the years, you guys are probably approaching, what, fifty or $75,000 that you've donated yes, to sir. Access Yes at, really? at this time. Uh, very commendable. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. Andy. Thank you. If I may, too, just briefly talk about um, two years ago, we allocated $10,000 worth of scholarships to <laughs> seniors in Sheridan and Johnson County. This last year, we allocated $17,000 to uh, 17 students uh, to attend their college of their choice to further their education. So I just wanted to share that with you, too. All right. Thank awesome. You. See the director's getting a little bit of exercise this morning. That's good for him. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Mr. President, uh, Director Talbot, members of the commission. Um, next, we have uh, a presentation that uh, Doug Brimmeyer is going to um, take responsibility for most of the, the presentation. But I did want to kind of introduce the topic. Um, all of you heard from the public, um, some interested publics on this particular issue in July. And, um, and so really what, what the intent here is today, uh, this is a, our elk allocation, uh, elk license allocation process is extremely complex in our state for a variety of reasons. And um, so really um, before, you know, I think that, that the commission indicated pretty strongly that before they could consider um, changes to any, any of our license, license allocation systems that they needed to understand it better. And so really our intent today is not necessarily to provide you with any recommendations or anything like that, but simply to provide you some background and a summary of work that a committee within our department <laughs> did here a couple years ago that really analyzed this, this entire process and this system um, going back for several, several decades. It's important, I think, for the commission to note that um, this, the, the issue has been discussed a few times, but the, the process hasn't changed since the late 80s. And so um, regardless of whether the, you know, which way the commission decides to go with this, um, the department felt it would be a, an appropriate time to bring the issue forward so you could at least have the discussion. And um, I do believe, Mr. President, just um, so you're aware, there are at least a couple members of the public that I know want to comment on this um, uh, just for your planning purposes. And we do um, have a couple blue sheets, yes. So, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Doug and um, and again, ask Doug to kind of provide an overview of work that the department's already done on this on this problem. Welcome, Doug. Frank. Mr. President, uh, members of the commission, Director Talbot. Um, thanks. It's uh, my privilege to be able to synthesize about 45 plus years of information in about in a short presentation here. So, um, as Brian indicated, it's quite a process, 
and um, I'll try and shed some light on um, how we got to here and um, and uh, kind of summarize things for you. So basically what I'd like to do is talk about the 2014 agency review, um, talk about the license allocation history. It's got quite a, a history all the way back to the 70s. I'll kind of summarize um, current elk license allocation process, wh wh what we're doing right now, and then that 2014 uh, uh, committee, um, I'll kind of talk about the options that that group contemplated um, during the agency review that was completed at that time. And then finally, I'll wrap up with a, a summary of, of kind of some of the information on the, where we're at. So in 2014, as I mentioned, um, we had a committee that was comprised of a number of folks in the room here. And um, it, the committee's goal was to analyze the strategies to enhance the state's elk licensing system. And specifically, we were going to look at uh, the past efforts because we wanted to, to get an understanding of what occurred in the past, um, evaluate the, the current allocation, um, look at elk population changes because we knew that, um, particularly in the eastern part of the state, those populations were growing significantly. And the western part of the state, managers were concerned about you know, overall elk quality in the, the dem demographics of the herd. So the numbers of bulls, the number of calves. And so there were some concerns there. Um, we also interviewed employees and retirees who uh, participated in past efforts, and we uh, compared Wyoming's uh, license allocation system against those of other states. And then finally, we uh, looked at the, uh, the legal decisions that kind of were germane to this issue, and we kind of touched on those in this report. And you, you each should have um, a copy of that or a, a version of it on your in your notebooks. Excuse me. Bud, can we kill some of these lights on the north here? So, and I should mention that, um, that I just have a few pictures that Jeff Obrick scanned in from some of the Wyoming Wildlife and then Magazine, and then he went back and visited with uh, Rex Corsi, Chief Game Warden at that, you know, earlier years, and uh, Don Miller was working with the I&E. So, um, basically, these lines that you saw in the first picture and this one were the resident draw uh, for, for licenses, for antelope licenses. And in this particular photo, this was one of the years, uh, late 60s, and uh, in, in one of these photos, the, the line had to endure rain all night long. And then finally at daylight, the, the rain broke and sun came out, and then the sprinklers came on and sprayed all the people that were in line. So, <laughs> so in the 70s, um, non-resident elk licenses were issued on a first-come, first-served basis beginning on the first working day of the year. Um, in 1972, we had our first efforts to allocate licenses randomly. And then in, 90, in 1974, we ended up using uh, the computerized system to allocate those licenses. And then in 1976, uh, the, the commission actually appointed one of the first task forces to streamline the issuance of licenses. And this would be the first of four efforts. And, and uh, you'll see that it's got quite a bit of there's quite a bit of history in terms of the, the groups and the agency reviews that have went into this process. Um, in the 1980s, a uh, special task force um, that were, the task force that was created in the 70s actually implemented some of their recommendations through Chapter 44. And that was they took the three-year average of resident elk licenses and then they allocated 12% of that as non-resident licenses. So, the non-resident allocation was based on the three previous years of resident participation. Um, also around this time, the proposal was taken to the public <coughs> to increase that allocation from 12% to 20%. And then in 1987, the non-resident quota was set at 60, 16%. And then in 1989, um, the quota, which you see in your um, Chapter 44 documents, um, the 7,250 general license quota for non-residents was then adopted. And so the 16% that we use today and the 7,250 cap um, have not changed since they were established in 1987 and 1989, respectively. And this hopper is um, just over 20,000 non-resident antelope license uh, applications. And this was, um, again, right around 1970. Um, we usually ended up, uh, according to Rex Corsi and, and uh, Don Miller, we would have somebody from um, 
somebody from the audit department, and then usually the wildlife division asks for uh, people from across the state that were upstanding in the community to offer to come down and help with the drawing so that the department wouldn't be, um, there would, would be less uh, perception that there was, you know, um, op, you know the, there was favoritism on the draw. The resident licenses were sent out to the regions where the, where the field managers made recommendations and then there would be a, a first come first serve basis there. Um, 20,000 applications at that time for 15,000 um, actual licenses. In the 1990s, the department formed an internal committee, um, 1993, and we evaluated the allocating non-resident licenses similar to the deer regions. We also looked at that 7,250 cap and the 16% quota that was um, uh, assigned to the limited quota licenses. We went to the public and we were met with a strong opposition. Um, in 1995, the commission formed an allocation task force again. That commission, uh, that task force met for six months and they could not come up with any consensus at that time and so um, there was no options were forwarded at that time. Um, in 1997, the department again established another internal committee and the committee started forming alternatives but then they were put on hold. That committee was suspended because of pending litigation that was being uh, um, filed in court. In 2000, uh, the courts ruled in favor of the department on that 1997 uh, litigation. In 2003, another case was filed regarding the Wyoming's differential fee structure, um, including the license quotas and the non-resident wilderness guide law. And then in 2005, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in favor of the state of Wyoming on that case. Also in 2005, the Wyoming legislature created a special task force on the hunting segment of tourism. 2012, the number of elk licenses a sportsman could hold was increased to three licenses. And in 2017, as you just remembered from past recent meetings, we reinstituted the leftover license draw so that we would create an, an environment for app applying for those licenses that would provide a little more equity. So what's happened with elk populations since the 1980s? Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the, the elk numbers had been growing east in the eastern part of the state. We had elk showing up in a lot of places that in the 70s we didn't really even have, uh, you know, elk distributed. You might saw, might have seen one once in a while, but now it's pretty common to see elk, you know, east of Casper and east of uh, Laramie. So the population in the 80s was about 65,000 in the state, and now we're estimating that we're, you know, 114,000 elk in, in the state of Wyoming in 2014. Also what occurred at that time was the demographics of the population was starting to change and so we started to see an increase in bull ratios in a lot of these areas as well. And basically the elk populations again in the eastern part of the state were increasing and managers in the western part of the state and the public land areas were becoming more conservative to try and stabilize those populations, uh, particularly in those areas where we had recolonizing uh, large carnivores. If you look at a graphic of the, the statewide elk harvest um, through the 1980s here, um, and then more recently from 2000, 2005 right here to 2017, you can see that total harvest has increased significantly. We've also seen an increase in um, the cow harvest and the bull harvest has, has come up some as well. And keep in mind, again, that uh, the demographics show that the population's doing really well, um, particularly in the eastern part of the state and there's some opportunity um, available for, for more hunting in some places. So before I get into where we're at today with the current system, I uh, wanted to touch on what types of licenses influence the availability of, of the non-resident participation. So if you look at, um, you'll remember from March when we did the um, kind of the, the orientation for the com new commissioners, we talked about license types. And so our first license type is a general, and then we also have limited quota licenses. General are um, typically available in an unlimited number, but because the non-residents um, have a real interest in hunting in Wyoming, we, we set a cap on the number of, not, of general licenses that are typically available. Limited quota um, is, of course, a limited number of licenses. 
And then we also have licenses that are full priced or reduced priced. And typically the reduced price licenses are the, the cow-calf licenses or the doe-fawn licenses for, for antelope and deer. So the current process, um, Commission Regulation Chapter 44 establishes that cap of 7250 on the number of full priced um, limited quota and general licenses that can be issued to non-residents. And that's just in the initial draw. So that initial draw, of course, occurs in, in uh, February. And so those people that are in that initial draw, they're limited to that total number right there. So then the second part of this is, is that the commission regulation also establishes that 16% of all limited quota elk licenses are issued to non-resident applications in that initial draw. So the total number of general licenses available to non-resident hunters is basically the difference between that 7250 cap and the number of limited quota licenses allocated. And I'll explain this a little bit further because it's, it's pretty confounding when you, first start, you know, when you first start looking at this for its face value. So this year we had, even though we had a 7250 cap on general licenses and limited quota licenses, we end up with 4,443 general license hunters for elk um, in the state. And, I'll, and I'll, again, I'll try and get into this a little bit more with more slides here. So just an example of this. If you had 10,000 elk license proposed for full price limited quota, you take 16% of that 10,000, that means there's 1,600 full price limited quota licenses that will be issued to the non-residents in that initial draw. The 7,250 total cap then is um, the, the, the first number you take 1,600 from that to estimate what your total number of licenses will be issued as general for those non-residents. So again, down here you got 7,250 cap. You have the percentage, the 16 percent of the statewide limited quota licenses for those elk, non-resident elk, and then you end up with how many of those will be general licenses. And as I mentioned earlier, the previous slide. This year, that calculation came to 4,443 licenses for general license non-resident hunters. <clears throat> so basically, it ends up being a negative relationship between the number of general licenses and the full price limit quota licenses available to those non-residents. And basically, once you increase the limit quota licenses, that means there's going to be less general licenses available for the non-resident hunters to, to um, have opportunity to hunt. The other thing that I mentioned we, with the license types, we do have those reduced price licenses, and they're also allocated on a 16% basis in that initial draw, but they do not influence the general license availability. So um, that was one of the changes that was made quite a few years ago is to maintain that general license availability, because if you issued a 1,000, reduced price licenses, you know, there would have been an influence of that influencing the number of general licenses. So when that was changed so that the reduced price licenses would not influence general license structure, that basically stabilized that availability. Because the, the state, we, we issue quite a few reduced price cow licenses across the, across the state. So, and again, the reduced price licenses are issued in addition to that 7250 cap. And in recent years, um, so this graph you can see, this is the non-resident full price licenses um, available. And then the, once we started issuing reduced price licenses in here, um, we started providing quite a bit of opportunity for um, cow hunting in, in parts of the state. And again, we average about 4,500 to 4,600 um, general licenses each year for those non-resident hunters. When you look at the other species, um, you know, Chapter 44 outlines the percentages that are allocated for the rest of the species as well. And so when you look at antelope, it's an 80-20 split, just like mule deer. And the, the resident draw is reserved for 80% of those licenses. And I'll just focus on antelope to start with. But with antelope, it's all limited quota licenses. There's, there's no um, general license. So, Residents get the first draw, 
and then once the the eighty percent is allocated up to eighty percent then the remaining licenses then are offered in the non-resident draw and if I'm if, if I'm step out of line here I'm gonna have Jean kind of try and get my attention because she's more of an expert on this um, so in 2016 we had 52,000 licenses resident sales only accounted for about 50% of that and so the remaining licenses then went to the non-residents and so non-residents ended up with just over 50% of that allocation Mr. President. yeah I've got a question I'm sorry I think so that didn't include buck and doe licenses that's all limited quota licenses, oh, full price, yeah. limited quota. So the reduced price licenses um, still are all allocated at that level, correct, Gene? So when you say 26,000 antelope licenses were issued, that's full price buck and doe and then reduced price doe and fawn licenses. That's a whole shooting match. Is that correct, Gene? I believe that's correct for because that makes a difference when you get down to the elk also if you got that includes reduced price plus the full it's, price licenses. Yeah, Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, members of the commission and Commissioner and tell me, I, I will have Gene take a look at that, but it, I think it's total non-resident participation for that particular for species. This, the same with, uh, with mule deer, you have an 80-20 split and the resident drawing occurs early enough that they get they initially get allocated the 80 percent on the limited quota but then non-residents can also purchase the um you know in the draw they can the remaining limited quota licenses that residents don't pick up can be available so here's your um it's the total total antelope is 52,000 yes so that's all full and reduced price it, and that is, Gene said, it's full and reduced price. So mule deer are quite a bit different, though, than antelope because you, you have the 20% of the limited quota licenses issued to non-residents, but each of the regions also have, there's 15 different non-resident general license areas for non-residents to apply. So as most of you are familiar with, there's a region, you know, A through H, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of different regions, 15 of them across the state. Those are non-resident general licenses, but it's defined to a geographic area. And so, you know, the non-residents are set a general license quota by those 15 areas, by the regions, based on population demographics and what they're seeing from, you know, previous harvest statistics from previous years. And so, um, with mule deer, we had um, total sales 83,000, um, almost 50, well, just over 58,000 for residents and 24,700 for non-residents, which equated to almost 30% of the license allocation for that, for mule deer. With elk, um, you know, it's an 84-16 split, just on the basis of limited quota licenses, and then we also have that 7,250 cap, as we talked about earlier. We had 71,000 license sales in 2016, almost 50, 59,000 residents and almost 13,000 non-residents. And so the percentage actually allocated once it's all said and done for total number of participants, non-resident versus resident, it's almost 18% non-resident. When you get into the other species, moose and bison are both an 80-20 split as well. And here again, the, the, the resident demand is high enough that they take the total 80% allocation. So whatever the quote is for the, the entire state, the residents do get their 80% and the non-residents get their 20% split. With bighorn sheep and mountain goat, um, that's a 75-25 split. And there again, there's a high resident interest in those. And so the demand for those, the resident proportion of that equals, you know, exceeds what's available. And so none of those licenses are rolled back over to the non-residents. And I and there's there's one other one other uh, factor that probably we should I'll just touch on is that if there's 1,600 limited quota licenses, 16% that's allocated to non-residents, if only 1,500 
non-residents put in for that allocation of 16, then that means there's another 100 licenses that are unallocated out of that quota. And so that basically, those licenses then are converted to a general license. And I hope I don't confuse that, but, but it's, you know, the initial allocation is that 16%. And then if the non-residents don't subscribe to that, by chapter 44, we still issue 7250. So they're, they're, those licenses then roll over and become a general license. So. Thanks. So in 2014, again, that committee basically came up with four um, alternatives that we felt were pretty viable that we, we needed to talk a little bit more about. The first one is the status quo, maintain that current allocation process. The second option was is to eliminate the 7250 cap and set an independent statewide quota of non-resident general licenses. We didn't really decide how that would occur, but, but we felt that instead of having that 7250 cap, we'd have something that could be fluctuated from year to year. Third option was convert all full price limited quota antlerless licenses to reduce price cow-calf licenses. So if you look across the state, there's a number of type four elk licenses, which type fours are typically an antlerless elk license, but there's a high resident demand for them. And so the managers typically left those at a full price license. But if, again, if you had a thousand of those type four licenses, um, that was 160, 16% um, would be allocated to non-residents, and then that would be subtracted from that 7250 quota. Um, the fourth option was establish non-resident general elk regions and set, let the, the geographic area, like if it's Cody, let the managers there set a quota for the non-residents instead of having a statewide quota and then letting hunters filter into that area. And I'll, I'll try and explain that a little bit more with this map. And, um, pretty, pretty, there's a lot of information on this map, but first thing to look at, I guess, is the, the color, the shading that's on it. And if you've got a real light shading, typically there's eight to 50 non-resident licenses in that hunt area. And if you get to the darker tones, you'll see that there's anywhere between 200 to, to 360 non-resident hunters in those, those hunt areas. And so you can look at um, west of Laramie, um, southwest of Cody, and then around Jackson, you've got a lot of non-residents that participate in those hunts. And they're public land hunts, and uh, typically, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in those as a general license. So in 1990, uh, I guess in 2014 when we evaluated this, and also in 1993 when that first allocation committee started meeting, they divided the state up into regions, just like, an, just like the non-resident deer regions. And then we took the total number of hunters within this region. So, um, you know, you look at um, the, Sheridan, the Sheridan region right here, for example, there's about 141 non-residents hunted from 2011 to 2013. That was the average. You get over to Casper, there was 102 in this, this particular area that had some general license hunting. In Laramie, they'd also have a quota of about 100 non-residents. West of Laramie, it was 350. Green River, um, this, this um, portion of the Sierra Madres to the west, um, non-resident quota, they had about 600 non-residents hunting in that area during those three years. So when you get to the western part of the state, things start to pick up a little bit more. Um, Pinedale had a quota of about 350 in these areas here. Um, and that's the, the general license participation. The limit quota areas we did not we did not try and work them into this, this um, analysis just because they're already allocated the 16%. But on, non on the general license areas across the state, if you draw a, your non-resident, if you draw a general tag, you can hunt anywhere that's general. And so typically those non-residents that have that gravitate towards those areas that have more public land and typically have a little higher elk population. And so you can see south of Jackson from Afton north to um, the Snake River, typically there's a little over 900 non-residents hunting in that, those hunt areas in that part of the state. And then when you get to Jackson, um, again, a lot of public land, um, you know, historically 
renowned elk populations and so there's a lot of interest from non-residents to hunt in those areas and so typically on a three-year average they have about a thousand non-resident hunters and so what what we would this proposal um, as an option they the managers felt that the regions could adjust that non-resident quota based on what the elk populations and what the availability of opportunity would be um, and so when you get to the eastern part of the state and there's more private lands you're you're working more with landowners to decide what's acceptable and what's uh, what opportunity is there for those folks to hunt <clears throat> when you get to the western part of the state or in the south central you're gonna the managers would base a lot of that decision on hunting participation and uh, the herd demographics and calf ratios, bull ratios, and that sort of thing. So that committee from 2014 also discussed some other options, and, and one was hold the resident draw after the resident draw in June, and, and this report that we provided to you, Wyoming stands alone uh, in the West in terms of the availability for people to um, apply. And, and so they can apply real early in January, and by the end of February, they know if their money's tied up on a western hunt or if they should try and, and uh, get a hunt somewhere else. And so we, we um, provide an opportunity for folks to be able to determine where they can hunt in the west, and, and we're one of the few states that does that. Um, and so we felt that that was not a valid option to change that drawing date. Um, another option that we decided not to pursue further was to increase non-resident general license issuance um, using the 8416 split rule based on the prior year's resident general license sales. So in the 70s and the early 80s, we were, we were basing that non-resident allocation on a percentage of the previous year's participation by resident hunters, and we decided that wasn't an option. Talked about converting full price antlerless licenses to, to reduced cow calf licenses, along with a commensurate reduction in that 7250 cap. We also talked about raising that 7250 cap on non resident full price licenses issued through the non resident draw. So, finally, um, the summary, and again, this is that drawing for the non resident uh, antelope licenses in the, in the early 70s or late 60s. Um, this issue has been through internal and external reviews in the past. Um, it hasn't been changed much since 1969, and uh, it's also had some litigation to try and get it to influence the change. Um, public interest in this issue remains high, as I'm sure most of you have, are aware of that. And um, you know, one of the other significant factors is, is that elk populations have changed since the late 80s when these the cap and the 16% were first adopted. And so with that, um, I guess Brian and I can take some questions and uh, let me know. Question, President, Mr. Crank, what, what is, where did the cap come from and what logic was the 7250 based on? And <coughs> it based, you know, um, Mr. President and Commissioner Crank, members of the commission, um, it basically was an evolution. So in the, in the 80s, when there was a discussion of how to allocate that, they started looking at 12% of the three previous years of resident sales. And so they wanted to limit it somehow, and they felt that a three, the 12% of the resident participation was a reasonable approach to, to take that. And that was the first step. And then it evolved to 16%. Um, there was proposals in the late 80s to go to 20%. <coughs> And there was proposals to up a, set a cap, a standard cap, and that's what we ended up with. Well, I, I guess um, so. It causes me great heartburn to think about increasing non-resident licenses in limited quota areas because we have no resident preference point system, and <coughs> have residents who spend 10, 15 years to, trying to draw an elk license in what is it fortification creek or or you know the some of our, our primo elk areas so it causes me great heartburn to say we'll give more of those to non-residents but I, what i'm trying to understand is why i mean that's automatically set at 16 percent why would we have a cap on the number of general elk licenses that we sell in wyoming i mean i assume if we're setting a general elk season <coughs> we believe the population could carry 
almost unlimited honey. I mean, because that's what we're saying by issuing general licenses. Why would we set a 7250 cap? Yeah, um, Mr. President and um, Commissioner Crank. So the, the reason that we have that cap is, is because the demographics in those Western public land hunt areas, um, if you did not have a cap, um, we see that there's a lot of interest from somebody that draws a non-resident tag um, gravitating towards those areas where there's a lot of public land. And, and when this was brought up in the past, managers were extremely sensitive to bull quality and maintaining herd quality. And if, if you can't control a factor in management with the participation from people wanting to hunt, you can't have everybody hunting the same demographic portion of the population. So if you said in any elk season, there'd be a lot of people pursuing those bulls. And, uh, and so there's concern that that would kind of affect that bull quality. If that, does that answer your question? I think it does. Um, so I guess what you're telling me is, is if we didn't have a cap on non-resident general elk licenses, we might impact the demographics of our elk herd in the Very western nice. part of the state where you have large, long, open general elk seasons. That's correct. Yeah. And Commissioner Crank, too, we would have, um, certainly we would have um, concerns from sportsmen, both residents and non-residents, with crowding in, in areas like the Snowy Range, for example, where there are four general license hunt areas, it's public land. If there was no cap on how many, you know, that's just one example, but if there was no cap statewide on how many non-residents could get a general elk license in the state, we would we would see an increase, probably a pretty significant increase in the number of non-resident hunters that came to our state. Mr. President, if I may. Pat? How do our non-resident elk license prices compare to Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, I guess, maybe. If, and if you don't know, I guess I didn't. I don't know if we have the prices though. We so on page fifteen of your white Frank. paper. One, one it's like Anselmi's ahead of you, which is really scary, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course it's not. <laughs> No, if you look um, on page 15, there is a comparison there. And it looks like, you know, Wyoming is is kind of in the middle of the pack, which was our analysis when we um, did the same thing for the last fee increase. So, yeah, I mean, we're our, our demand is extremely high. We sell all of our non-resident elk licenses, which is different than, for example, Idaho. Um, but our price point, even with the fee increase, is still, it's probably on the upper end of the midpoint for the, the surrounding western states. Okay. Mr. President? Mark, this white paper was very interesting. And, uh, the older studies that like Terry Cleveland did and all these other, and all your task force, and it, it was very reassuring to see that you gave, they gave a, a committee a, an assignment and they looked at everything. I was really pleased to see that they, you know, they didn't cherry pick their, they gave it all. But uh, I guess one thing I pulled out of this, there's, uh, different constituencies here and correct me if the way I read this you got you got the non-resident hunter and that's kind of in two you could look at them in two different ways you got the guided hunter the more affluent hunter that's going to come out here and want to shoot a bull and you got the other non-resident guy I got my brother-in-law in Wisconsin he wants to come out here and, and shoot a cow elk and then you got the resident hunter too so you got three different constituencies that this is affecting and I was also happy to, you know, some of the uh, recommendations that came out of this were instituted, which was reassuring. Sometimes you have a study and nothing happens, but the the, the, the draw and some of the and change in the prices and uh, but you went over this. But uh, if you add in the cow calf licenses and the, you get 18% of the elk licenses are issued to non-residents. And you got that 7250 cap, but then when then everybody goes into that <coughs> that other uh, that leftover drawing. So you get actually they got almost 13,000 licenses non-residents. That's the whole gamut. I thought that was interesting. It's not just 16 uh, percent. It's close to yep. 18 and in the cow calf. And there are people. It's just like a all this stuff. But uh, I remember being at a regional meeting and. We're talking about deer in the game where it says not everybody wants to come out here and shoot a 30 inch buck. Yeah, that's what you hear about. But he said, there's one of these young, you know, 
students here, you know, they want to go and shoot a buck deer. It doesn't have to be the wall hanger. And I think that's with elk too. There's people who want to come out and shoot an elk. It doesn't have to be a, a seven by seven coil elk. They want to just go out and shoot an elk. So I think you have to keep that in, in mind about the different constituencies that are, uh, that this would affect. And if we do anything or just the, very interesting. That white paper was very interesting. Mr. President, one thing I guess I would like to make sure too that um, just so the commission understands the department on this. We we didn't come here today with recommendations. We showed you the things that were contemplated by the committee. But if you want us to, to, to develop recommendations or ideas to consider and bring them back to the commission, um, that's certainly something we can do. One of those could be, you know, do nothing, leave it as it is. But I guess we're, we didn't come here today looking for direction on a specific direct you know, on a way to go on this but more on if you want us to continue to to investigate this and study it and bring you proposals or or what you want us to do okay um, we'll, okay go ahead you said elk, I don't know if you've addressed the detail populations increased I'd like to see you know is it on the eastern part of the state or where where are the I guess that's where it is but what areas you know and if those are all limited quota then I don't know how you but I'd like to see those, you know, where, I, like you said, in the west, it's stabilized. That's where I'm more familiar with the western part of the. Yeah, and we can certainly um, more visually depict that so you can kind of see. But really, I mean, realistically, from, from 1980, um, there aren't very many places where we haven't had at least some increase in elk populations. And the one thing that, um, that I think Doug pointed out pretty clear early on was that the bull ratios have significantly increased. I mean, from an average of in the 80s of 15 to uh, 36 <coughs> last year. So there's more, a larger proportion of that increased population are bulls than what it was before. Is that in this year's, that's based on this year's count? 2016. The trend, the trend though has been kind of in the upwards, of upper 20s and then this year was in the 30s, 20s to low 30s. Somebody told me it's with the bad winter you're able to count more elk. That's, that's correct. More bull They're easier to find. bull groups are typically more isolated and they're at higher elevations and sometimes places we don't we don't go because it's hard to go in a, in a helicopter and this year because of the snow they were, they were more observable at this point I would like to uh, go ahead and address these blue sheets and then we'll have some time for discussion afterwards uh, first up Jeff Maratori did I say your last name right Jeff Mary Tory, okay. And you're uh, representing who? Uh, Wyoming Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, we're a relatively young organization uh, in Wyoming. Uh, we have board members in Cody, Lander, Casper, Cheyenne, Laramie, uh, 300 plus members and growing. Uh, we had the proud distinction of being named Chapter of the Year at, at the National Rendezvous in Montana. And that was based on uh, our work with hunting and fishing opportunities, public land, private land access through Access Yes, conservation, uh, ethical fair chase hunting. Um, <clears throat> we have discussed this, uh, this the elk hunting allocations, and uh, we have come to the conclusion that, uh, as a group, we'll vigorously oppose any changes to the limited quota elk license allocations. Um, as elk populations increase in limited quota areas, so does non-resident participation. Um, we also uh, oppose any increases to non-resident antlered elk hunting in general areas, um, unless it can be demonstrated by the department uh, that it is in the best interest of the herd uh, and will not negatively affect hunter densities. Um, we strongly feel and, and respectfully <coughs> ask that the commission uh, not try to fix something that isn't broken. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Jeff? Mark. Yeah, what, you gave a donation access, yes? Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have uh, donated, we have a standing um, event every year 
and the proceeds of that go to Access Yes. I believe uh, we have given Director Talbot one donation so far. And uh, we have, uh, we had that event already this year and there is another donation up and coming. I appreciate that. Uh, that goes back to these constituencies. You got the non-resident hunter that that's not on a guided hunt that benefits from more access and as do the residents uh, benefit from that. And thank you very much and with those donations. <coughs> yes. Hey, would you clarify, what's your position on general elk hunting? Uh, we feel that if there was an increase in non-resident participation in general areas that would put further pressure on bull elk and it would also increase hunter densities in the general areas. But you also said, did you not say that dependent upon game and fish recommendations on whether it was necessary or not? Is that, that correct? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Doobie, yes, that's correct. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Next up, Jeff Smith. And Jeff, if I'm correct, you are the president of the Wyoming Guides and Outfitters Association. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Director Talbot and President uh, Culver and commissioners. Uh, you know, what might be in the mindset of a lot of residents, you know, as the Outfitter Association, Outfitters, we're not interested in taking away licenses and opportunity to residents. And then also, you know, my feelings, and I would sure it'd be all of us as outfitters, uh, as uh, Commissioner Crank mentioned, you know, maybe the possibility of, of, you know, an unlimited number on, you know, general licenses. That is nothing that we would like to see at all, you know, as outfitters and, you know, protecting the resource. I believe with the elk populations the way they are right now, they could be raised, you know, on the, the cap to 7250, you know, could possibly rate, be raised to 9,000. That would depend on the commission and what the department finds, you know, when they check on, you know, from season to season. I think that would be a viable uh, number that it could go to and not hurt the resource, you know, with the numbers that are, are compared to 1989. Uh, but by no means we would, you know, as an outfitter myself, would like to see it unlimited. That just, you know, every non-resident come in here and hunt a bull elk. I don't think that's good for the state at all. But there is, I think the time is now that we could do something with, you know, with that overall number. And, you know, the the elk numbers have shown that, you know, we you could, you could stand hunting some more bulls. And maybe if there's an overcrowding, you know, in the future, in certain general areas, uh, maybe in the western part of the state, there could be come up, you know, with to set boundaries and set a guideline to put, you know, a, a regional general license on just like the deer. But, you know, maybe that's something that could be handled in the future if, you know, if the, if the pressure gets to be too much in a certain area. But as it stands right now, with the numbers the way they are, you know, we would like to see an increase in some number that the commission could, you know, you know, feel good about. But there, there, this is the time where we could increase the number. As for limited quote areas, uh, sure, we'd like to see it 20%, just like the deer and the, you know, in the antelope. But you know, that's taking away a resident's tag going that route. Maybe there could be consideration to look at it that there be, you know, two separate quotas where it doesn't hurt you know, residents getting a tag. We're not, we're not interested in taking, you know, resident tags away. I mean, my kids hunt, my relatives hunt. Uh, you know, I got an uncle sitting in here that, you know, is, he hunts, you know, in elk, bull elk here in the state. We're not interested in that. But I believe there's times and there, there this is a time and we could look at some things and the commission would like to see, look further into it, you know, to be able to come up to something that could have a little bit more non-resident opportunity without going overboard so that's the stance that the outfitter association takes and me myself being an outfitter i don't know if any questions, questions? Mr. President, I have a question. Mike. jeff uh, uh what's the reason the wyoming outfitter and guides association would like to see that increase to nine thousand? well it would help with i mean it, it's dropped to where you know, it's not a 100% deal where a guy can come back year after year right now. 
that that is going away with with you know the demand in Wyoming that is going away and we feel like there's enough elk to handle going up but you know it used to be you know just three years ago you could have someone come in with no points you know I could have a hunter hunt with me in a general area year after year that has slipped away with the demand and with that increase too I hunt a limited quota area also I had some limited quotas areas that are kind of pretty tough to draw. Well, when the demand is up, I mean, when the before before the demand was so high, you could have your hunter put in for a limited quota area. If he didn't draw, he could draw that general tag on the second choice. That that hasn't been like that for the last three or four years now, and that stops losing hunters to other states. A guy can put in for a limited quota area, hoping to draw some of these areas where it's producing these huge bulls, you know, and maybe draw it. But if he doesn't, he still has an opportunity to hunt Wyoming. If he doesn't draw that limited quota area, you know, he's going to go to another state. So that and and the other and the other reason increasing the the you know their overall cap, the numbers prove that it, you know there's way more elk right now than there's been back in 1989. And we don't want to see it unlimited. I mean, I, I dang sure don't want to see it just an unlimited non-resident general license. That would be no good for anybody. And the reason I asked the question is, is I got on your website, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like you guys, uh, with your with your registered outfitters last year, had about 3,220 elk hunters, is what, the way I understand it, booked through guides and outfitters last year mm -hmm. in the state of Wyoming. So More. I, yeah. So I wonder, you know, um, I mean, with the cap of 7,250, that's still 4,000 hunters out there somewhere that you guys can get a hold of somehow. Well, that gives opportunity to the guys going to do it themselves, too. Well, true. There's going to be a certain amount of those. You know, and that's, you know, that, that person needs to be able to hunt, you know, have opportunity. Also, we're, we just, you know, it's the higher percentage, you know, in, when it comes to mule deer and antelope not near that high percentage hunts with an outfitter, you know, compared to the elk. You know, it well, is right that, I mean, you, you see it there that, you know, more likely uh, a guy's going to book with an outfitter if he's hunting elk than he is deer and antelope. Right. But, I mean, overall with the with the 7250 cap and then all the mm -hmm. reduced tags, there's over 12,000 non-resident elk tags available. That's only a 27%, you know, 26, 27% non-residents that are using the outfitter or guide right now. Yes. Is that, I mean, is that pretty standard year to year? Or? Pretty much just stays like that. That's what I've noticed through the years. That's about the percentage that goes with an outfitter. So of that additional, uh, you know, eight, 9,000 elk hunters, how many more elk hunters can, can you guys attract? Well, I'm, it just seems I to me there's a lot of non-resident elk hunters available for the outfitter there, there services is. in the state. There is, it's just the, you know, the point where it got to somebody it's taken away the opportunity for someone to come year after year you know with an outfitter that's the biggest driving mm -hmm. point for you for you yeah, and and we feel that the you know the herd can handle without hurting you know and, and i'm sure that's true too but i think that's part of the attraction of wyoming too is all of our, oh, yeah all of our herd numbers are up they're close to objective I, oh, I hear it all the time i hunt guys well you know from they hunt everywhere, all all through the, you know, the United States. And I'm telling you, Wyoming Game and Fish Commission does an excellent job for opportunity and for trophy because I hear it all the time, guys hunting other states. Well, I know as a hunter myself, I mean, with a reasonable knowledge of elk and, and uh, if you got a little ambition, you could find elk in Wyoming. Oh, yes, sir. There's no, no problem with that. So, Mark, did you have okay. a question? Thanks, Mark. Jeff. My, I'm sorry, Mike. Did I cut you? No, off? I'm done. Okay. Thanks. Well, no, just a statement. But the non-residents are on preference point system. So if he drew the license, what's it take now to get up uh, three points or two? Or is there any numbers on that? Or? To, uh, basically, two to get a general tag on the regular price license. So if a guy draws and he loses two points, so he's got to for him to draw the next year. If he, I guess, if he had more licenses, then he'd use up more of those people with two and three points. But well, it's keeping a hunter being able to hunt with you, you know, the next year. 
you know, when, when you know, because they're going to lose their points as soon as they draw their first choice. Other questions for Jeff? Yeah. Yes, Pete. Another question for Jeff. One of my concerns is is not is not limited quota areas. It's the general areas, mm -hmm. and especially eastern Wyoming. Uh, when I say east, I mean east of the Bighorns in the Powder River Basin. There's getting to be a, quite a large herd in that area, in, in the, throughout that area, that we're having a hard time getting access to. Uh, it's a lot of private land, obviously, so it's a problem. But with the current system, it's hard to get any kind of harvest on those elk. And I've seen it in some of the places that we've hunted that it, it has a big detriment on your mule deer hunting. Yeah. especially in the areas where the elk get to be very <coughs> prolific uh, places. So the problem I have with it is, is that 7250 has no basis in, 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 in biology when it comes to the general license. Obviously it does for limited quota because that's set on a particular area. But when it gets out to the general areas, we're going to have to face some situations where if the elk continue to expand the way they are in those areas, how we're going to get some kind of harvest on them. I'm not here to present any type of plan to that, but that's the concern I have with the 7250 cap. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Just a, so is there a problem of access or is there a problem of enough hunters out there? I guess that's something that Well, that'll be both in those particular areas. Yeah. Other discussion? Mr. President? I'm, yes. I'm sorry, Gay Lynn, did I cut you off? I'm still thinking, go ahead. <laughs> um, I guess it's a question for either one of you, Duggar or Brian. Um, It, what what um, public processes are ongoing, if any, to seek um, input from you know our our different constituents, as Mark calls them, but you know hunters, resident hunters, non-resident hunters, outfitters, um, landowners. Is there is there any process uh, ongoing, and and do you think we have the resources and time to do another study of this? Um, Mr. President, Commissioner Crank, if it's the Commission's desire to explore additional options, um, our recommendation would be that, that yes, when, when the Commission, you know, had it narrowed down to a couple, three different options, that, that it went through a pretty robust public process. Um, any change to this allocation system is a big deal in our state and should go through, you know, rigorous public scrutiny and public comment and so um, that that would be our recommendation if the Commission wants to move forward from, from here. Well, Go Mr. Ahead, President, one more. I mean I, I think that's kind of our job as a Commission is to listen to all those different interest groups that are very passionate about wildlife so what you know that's that's Pat Crank's opinion I mean what do you two think do you think that would be worthwhile going forward with something like that seeing if out of that process, we, we develop some consensus about what we need to do? Mr. President, Commissioner Crank, um, I think based on the fact that, um, that this hasn't been discussed in public for a significant amount of time, and based on the, the fact that, you know, Commissioner Doobie had a good point with some of the biological facts on the ground, that, that there, there are more elk now and there are more, um, Things have changed, I guess, since the commission made a final decision on this particular issue three and a half decades ago. So I, the short answer to your question is, um, yes, I think it is worth the commission's time to at least consider it. And you know, at the end of the day, maybe the commission decides not to, not to do anything but leave the, the system as it is. But having the public discussion is probably the important part of, of the process. Yes, Pat. Mr. President, I mean, how, how, how do you envision that? Brian, uh, uh, some kind of, I hate unwieldy task forces where you have 42 people, you know, and they, they have a tough time making the decision, but could you could you put together some type group that could go around the state and seek public comment that was, you know, had the different folks, I mean, that, that are passionate about our wildlife, resident hunters, non-resident hunters, outfitters, uh, wildlife viewers, landowners, I mean, is that what we're talking about, or we've, uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Crank, we've we've kind of had two models that we've used in the past. One is a primarily internally driven model where we just go out. The the department holds a series of, of public hearings around the state. Um, this is one option that the department would have, you know, several ideas on the table and would hear from anybody who wanted to come to those 
um, anybody that wanted to come to those public meetings. And then another option would be to, and we've used this as well, where we form some kind of a working group. We've used it on a more localized scale before. Uh, I think the most recent was the Cody Elk Working Group, where we used members of the public from all of the diverse um, stakeholders and interests, and we put them all together with the department on a committee and, and did just exactly what you just explained. And so um, the department would be prepared to move forward with either one of those, I think. Um, you know, I, I hadn't thought about the, the kind of statewide working group, but um, considering the magnitude of this change, that's probably um, this kind of a change or this kind of a discussion would be worthy of that, that type of an effort, I think. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President? Yes. Aren't we working on now a task force for the what our goals are, what the public wants, isn't it? What, uh, what's it called? What's that group we just hired? The Responsive management. Responsive management. But that's going to well, take some time. That's going to take some time, and I think this, what you're talking here, is another thing that's going to take a lot of time. I, I think your responsive management, you could get some of these answers as far as uh, what the public wants and what uh, they feel are mission should be, but uh, in reading this white paper, all the different, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the results are going to be any different than what you had in 1992 or, or these other ones. You had Terry Cleveland on the top, you got a building named after him over there. You know, what, what, uh, what they found, I don't think the president, I don't think anything's going to change. I, I think if you, if you have to address an overpopulation health, you're going to have to work on access and getting people out there. I don't know if giving more non-resident licenses is the answer to, to uh, harvesting some elk. But I think you gotta decide what you're gonna, you know, you're looking at this other study and then you're gonna have another task force and you're gonna be task force out. That's just my opinion. Gaylene Lee, do you have a? Well, I'd, I just have been considering everything, but due to the increase, it seems like we talk about it might have issues feeding elk, too many on the feed grounds, I guess, in my mind, maybe we need to do s something to decrease the elk numbers, whether it's increased hunting, which is probably it. I mean, maybe that's going to help, but we're talking too many elk all the time. So maybe we do have to go forward with this and look at whether it's, I don't know, more access or more non-resident hunters, more licenses for everybody. I don't know, but it seems like too many elk keeps coming up aside from what we do to take care of it. So I think there's a consensus on the commission that we do need to look at this and we do need to involve the public. We have to decide which process we're going to use, our, our normal, whether we ask you as a department to work up some alternatives, come to us at the November meeting and present those and then select some, run them through the public information gathering process or where we, uh, go through the process that, that Pat discussed. What's the commission's thoughts on how we should proceed? Mr. President, if I may, because yes. I think it's important to the commission's consideration on this, the, the, uh, the uh, responsive management effort deadline or completion date basically is June. That's when their work will be complete and they will prepare their final report or final uh, plan. So is it your suggestion that we somehow roll this in with our responsive management uh, survey? No, that's that's not my recommendation at all, Mr. President. I just think that um, there will be some information that comes out of that that may be germane to this issue. We definitely, I don't think, want to tie the two together. I'm looking right. at the director to make sure he agrees with me on that. But No, Mr. President, members of the commission, there may be some uh, uh, nuggets that come out of the responsive management survey that would uh, provide some insight on this issue, but I certainly see the, the issues being very, very different as far as, as where we go on, on this. Okay. Mr. President? Yes, Pete. I, I think if we're going to have a discussion <laughs> at all, we got to have some options. If you just spitball out there and just have public all over the place, we won't really be that productive. I think there have to be several different type of possible options that people can voice their concerns over and and yay or nay or modify or whatever. That, that's my opinion. I think it would be more focused. Otherwise, it's just going to be everywhere. Well, Mr. President, I mean, did anybody look, you know, there's these four potential license allocation options that were on 
on well, what page eight? I, yeah. What, Mr. President, was that um, just done away Mr. with? Or? Those are the four things that the committee kind of had discussion over, but that did not, um, you know, there's probably more options than that. I mean, that that's two years old, and and that that wasn't the focus of the committee was to come up with those recommendations. Those are the things that they after they identified all the issues that they they had some kind of initial discussion on as options. But. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, if I may, um, I would suggest that, that while we're talking about these options, that uh, Brian and Doug and, and Wildlife Division go back, look at those options based on this conversation with the commission, and come back at the November commission meeting with a proposal for this commission on, on and present options for, for your discussion and, and approval, and also look at a time frame and a manner and a method to go out and get public input on that. And the uh, commission can have those discussions, and, and we can come back and look at specific options on, on different avenues to approach this. Mr. President, Pat? I think our director's idea is a great idea, but I'd also, I guess, um, urge the public, if you're interested and you want to, you think there are other options other than those four or things that the department and this commission ought to consider, that between now and November, <clears throat> you know, those folks get a hold of Brian or Doug and, or Wildlife Division and say, Here, here's another thing, option we think you should look at here, just so we have a broad kind of scoping process to tell us what this group, whether it's going to be a, some kind of task force or just an internal working group, is going to go forward and look at for us. I do think, Mr. President, as you're discussing this, I mean, Commissioner Crank um, and Commissioner Duby have points that 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 uh, my experience tells me are going to be are going to come true if we have this this discussion and we bring some options to the commission and then go talk to the public <coughs> about it. A lot of times, what we've seen happen is is when we go out with a, a set of options to the public, um, what comes mm -hmm. of that, or you know, what the final product of that discussion or work um, effort is, is not the first four options or the first two options. It, they kind of morph and change as people discuss them and more ideas come out, but you have to have a starting point, as Commissioner Doobie said, and that um, I think is, is sound advice, very intuitive. And one, uh, one thing that I know the agency knows, but I think everybody needs to be aware, is that our licensing procedure, especially for elk, is so complex now that we are taxing the abilities of our licensing section and our IT staff and anything we do come up with should be should also include some somewhat of a license simplification certainly not make it more complicated or we may well be looking at have to go having to go to a third party vendor for licensing um, just need to bear that in mind so mr. president yes I think we need to keep in mind why we're having this discussion. I mean, the way I remember it back in our July meeting, it was brought forward by the uh, Wyoming Outfitter and Guides Association about increasing uh, non-resident elk license sales. Correct. That's why we're talking about this. And I mean, it's to me, based on my research, there's plenty out there. Um, now, Pete brings up an interesting problem, and that's something that, in my opinion, maybe could be addressed by the local regional folks there on how to get access to to manage that that herd of elk but other than that I just see a lot of time a lot of wasted energy and a lot of wasted time analyzing this thing when we're probably going to come back to the same answer anyway that's my opinion what is the desire of the Commission I guess I'd like to have the department come back to us and talk to us in November about potential issues and what how they envision this study might be. And if we don't think it works, we can vote it down. If we think it might work, we'll tell them to go forth and do their good work. And I don't think we need a motion or a vote on this issue, but is there a consensus on that? I would agree with that. Yes, I'll take I would that. too, yes. Okay. The agency is so directed. And we will see you in November. Thank you, Mr. President.
Thank you. With that, we will uh, take a short break and we'll see you back here in, let's say, 10 more minutes, okay? Thank you.
guess we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Our first presenter, Mr. Ed Burke. Thank you, Commissioner President Culver, Commissioner Director Talbot. Uh, this next presentation will be an informational presentation on landowner licenses. So, um, Wyoming statute 231302H basically authorizes the commission, directs the commission to issue landowner licenses to landowners that meet specific regulatory provisions, and those licenses are issued outside the regular competitive uh, draw process. This is the uh, statute verbatim. And then additionally, in addition to the statute, Commission Regulation Chapter 44, Section 9 spells out that landowner licenses shall only be, sh be issued to landowners who own land, which provides habitat for antelope, deer, elk, or wild turkeys, and again, meet other regulatory requirements, which I'll get into. Uh, they provide the opportunity for the landowner applicant or a member of the landowner applicant's immediate family to hunt antelope, deer, or elk, or wild turkeys on the landowner's property in the case where licenses for a hunt area have been limited in number and only available through a competitive drawing. So basically what that says is that if you have a general deer or elk season, um, we do not issue landowner licenses because those are unlimited in number and you can just buy those over the counter and, and so uh, you don't have to worry about a competitive drawing. And then if you own land and then you subdivide it for the purposes of obtaining landowner licenses or maximizing landowner licenses uh, that does, admit, does not allow you to um, apply for and get landowner licenses. You can't have a ranch or a large chunk of property divided up into four sections specifically for getting landowner licenses and then applying for those landowner licenses. Some definitions that we'll use throughout this is uh, what a landowner is, a landowner applicant and a landowner applicant's immediate family. Um, we've really expanded on these uh, just to make it absolutely clear of who can and who cannot apply as a landowner. So landowner, other than just an actual physical person, means an individual, partnership, corporation, trust, limited liability company, or a combination of these, which either owns real trust in fee simple title or acquiring equitable interest by written contract. An example of that would be is uh, here in uh, Campbell County, the coal mine. Uh, if you're a uh, coal mine employee, you are a considered a landowner because you have trust or a share in that property and so they have a drawing every year for two employees that get the landowner licenses for the coal mine here south of Gillette. Landowner applicant again is actually the same basic definition but it's actually actually the person who is applying for the license and then landowner applicants immediate family we expand the, the, the uh, ability to apply for a license landowner license to that Landowner applicant's immediate family, so that means the landowner license, landowner applicant's spouse, landowner applicant's parents, landowner applicant's grandparents, landowner applicant's lineal descendants and their spouses, or landowner applicant's siblings. And so that actually was expanded about uh, two or three years ago to allow landowner applicant's siblings into that as well. Since these are only limited in, in number to two, um, we're maximizing of who the landowner decides who they want to allow to to get their landowner license. <laughs> Any questions on definitions or anything so far? I think we're good. Okay, so qualifications. Here's the here's kind of the meat of the landowner license uh, program. <coughs> so you have to have a minimum of 160 contiguous deeded acres. That land has to be utilized <laughs> by the type of big game or wild turkeys for which the applicant is applying for, and it provides food, cover, water. Uh, another, the next bullet, the third one is another big one. You have to have a minimum of 2,000 days use, which is the number of animals, uh, the number of days that they are <coughs> present to qualify, and that has to be within the preceding 12 months. You're allowed no more than two big game species, or no more than two spring, or no more than two fall wild turkey licenses. So again, these are limited in number. Deer, elk, and antelope landowner license applications can be a combination of full price or reduced price licenses. So you can get like a full price elk and a reduced price cow calf. You get a full price elk and a doe fawn deer. You can get a full price deer or a doe fawn deer, but you're only, regardless, you're only allowed two per species. So technically, if you had um, 
your elk and antelope on your property, you could get two landowner elk licenses, two landowner deer licenses, and two landowner antelope licenses. <coughs> uh, regardless of a change of ownership of a particular land parcel, uh, there's only going to be two licenses issued for that calendar year. So if landowner A gets his landowner licenses in in March, he applies for them in March and then sells that in June. Those two that were issued in March carry over for the rest of the year and the new landowner does not qualify to get landowner licenses until the, until the next year. Uh, landowner license holders are not required to hunt on their land. Um, that's because there's more and more situations where animals are present and landowner meets qualifications, yet the animals are not there during the established hunting seasons. A lot of that has to do with damage situations. We have several either like winter or spring, summer, that uh, elk or deer or even antelope get onto these crop lands, uh, create damage, and then disperse during the fall hunting season. They're, they're not available. But the landowner is still meeting the uh, qualifications of providing, providing food, cover, water for uh, those species. So how do we evaluate um, property for landowner licenses? So um, we physically go out on the ground, either the uh, game warden and or biologist and, and the landowner work together to determine eligibility and meet regulatory requirements. So how do we calculate those 2,000 days use? Well, there's several different methods. One is actual landowner and or department counts, including damage classifications and day-to-day. -day. Um, that's, uh, that's probably one of the most common ones, but the one we're using more often, especially on areas where it may be um, some concern or that they're not meeting it. We actually physically go out on the ground and do what we call pellet counts. We, we do a random sample using a 11 foot plus uh, piece of string. We do a random sample. If you take that string and, and do a circle with it, that's 100 of an acre. And then we count the pellets within that group. On the average, deer, elk, and antelope defecate 13 uh, uh, pellets uh, 13 times a day. And those 13 pellet groups would equal one animal a day. So if you had 26,000 pellet groups, that would equal 2,000 days use. And we take that 100th acre sample, extrapolate that across the property, across the landscape, and calculate approximately how much uh, use we can determine on that on that land. Mark. So is it pellets or pellet groups? Oh, I'm sorry. 13 pellet groups Oops. equals one animal. And there's obviously a, the number of pellets in each group uh, could vary. 13 pellet groups, piles on the landscape, 13 of those would equal one animal. I'm sorry. So that's a, that's a method we use quite a bit, like I stated. Um, that really kind of puts the science into it and takes out any, any possible waiver or opinions, and, and we've held pretty fast to that. Application process. Um, Currently, landowner applicants submits a paper application to their game warden for approval. That's within a specific time frame. The local warden and the regional wildlife supervisor review and approve and submit that to Cheyenne for processing. Um, we're still, like I said, we're still on a paper application, but we're looking at trying to move forward with some type of electronic application system in 2018. Uh, if we can, if not, it'll be maybe 19. But it's basically the only uh, application that's still paper so um, some guys review up to almost 400 of these a year depending on uh, where they're at uh, big counties are Crook County and then over in Hot Springs County are areas where they have a tremendous number of landowner license applicants or up into the Bighorn Basin so how do we uh, issue and, and draw these so as stated earlier um, landowner licenses are issued without participating in a competitive drawing unless the number of licenses, license application exceeds the number of licenses for the hunt area. So um, if there's only 25 licenses, but there's 50 landowner license applicants, not everybody's going to get a license. So then that kicks in the um, second sentence there. If, if there is more applicants than there is licenses, we do an actual landowner license drawing. And uh, that could take all the licenses in a certain hunt area if we did that, and there would be no licenses to the, to the general public because those landowner licenses are drawn first before any other licenses, both resident and non-resident. And the appropriate uh, splits 
percentage splits for resident and non-residents also applies to landowner licenses as well. That we like the 16% for elk also applies to landowner licenses. Uh, as I stated, landowner license application shall be drawn first in respect of resident and non-resident initial drawings and against the total quota available, available in each respective hunt area. So here's kind of a unique thing for um, for uh, residents. Um, in case of license, uh, resident license availability, no full price landowner licenses shall be authorized if hunting with a general license is allowed at any time during the hunting season unless a general license is valid for antlerless deer or antlerless elk hunting only. So this will go into the next issue about the, the issue of not being able to uh, obtain a type 3 any whitetail deer license as a landowner license in a general area. Mr. Chairman? Yes, but Pete. for clarification, landowner licenses could consume the total quota in an area. Commissioner President Culver, Commissioner Doobie, that is correct. And I'll have some stats at the end here to kind of show you the breakdown of landowner licenses. Thank you. So basically what that says is, let's just take, uh, we'll just go to the, to the next slide and help explain it. So that, that sentence there about not being able to get a landowner license if, unless there's uh, in a general area, unless it's for antlerless deer or antlerless elk only, um, that does preclude a landowner from getting a type three any white-tailed deer license in a general license hunt area. So here's the example. Deer hunt area 66 is a general license area. It's open October 15th to 21st for antlered mule deer or any white-tailed deer. So that's the general license part of that season. So since that's a general license hunt area and it's not only for antlerless deer, that would preclude that type three, any white-tailed license being qualified, meeting the qualifications of a, of a landowner license. So Deer Area 66, 88, and 89 has a Type 3 uh, whitetail license, valid October 15th through November 30. And uh, since that's a limited quota license within a general hunt area, again, that does not qualify for the <coughs> landowner license provision. So general license exemption for landowner license is in line with the requirements of resident non-landowner non license applicants and that everyone has equal chance of drawing at least one deer license and initial drawing and two full price deer licenses in total. So chapter two outlines what you can get for licenses. So if, if we allowed the type three any white tail license in a general area to be issued as a landowner license, that landowner could also then go pick up a general license as it would be guaranteed two licenses, whereas the general public through the regular drawing process may only get one or possibly even no licenses um, if, if in the regular drawing process as outlined in, in chapter two. That makes sense. So basically we've said that the white-tailed deer license in a general area is if you want that you have to apply for it in the general and the regular draw process outside of the landowner license process. Scott, but if you're, if the general license was, was any mule deer, could you do that? And not any deer? Commissioner, President Culver, Commissioner Doobie, no. The, the regulation says it has to be antlerless deer. It has to be only for antlerless deer. In most of our areas where it's an antlered mule deer season, we've added on or any white-tailed deer. Right. So we've made that provision do one reason, one for the expanding of expansion of white-tailed deer and to allow for the opportunity to hunt both species, especially when it's antlered mule deer. So a unique thing for um, non-residents, especially on elk, is that, as previously just presented, that there is a cap on uh, non-resident elk licenses at 7250. So if a non-resident landowner puts in for a limited quota uh, elk license, and does not draw it, we do then allow them to be issued a general non-resident landowner license because that's the same opportunity we offer to residents. As a resident, if you don't draw a limited quota license, elk license, you can just go buy a general license over the counter. So we do offer the opportunity to non-residents in the elk drawing that um, if you don't draw that limited quota license as a landowner, we will turn around and issue you a, a general if you meet the qualifications. So we don't President. do many of those. 
Pat. Does that just apply to elk? Yes. Yes. So deer, deer and antelope would be different. Nope. Just, just. Uh, um, I believe it's mainly just elk because we will do it for deer on a few occasions, but it's mostly mostly happens in elk because of the 7250. And antelope isn't. There's no general season for antelope, so that's it doesn't fit into that thing. But we we'll, we will do it for for deer. Mr. President, so it does apply to both elk and deer. Correct, I'm sorry, yeah. So a non-resident landowner can do what a resident landowner can't. Is that right? One more time. Can a non-resident landowner do what a resident landowner can't? No, Come because on. a resident landowner can apply for a limited quota and probably draw that license, but if he doesn't draw it, he can automatically go over and pick up a general without any type of competitive drawing. Since resident, uh, non-resident deer licenses are limited, both by regions and by percentages of limited quota licenses, they don't have that opportunity if they don't draw the the, uh, the license. Okay, I got it. <clears throat> Thank you. So here's some some stats um, on uh, issuance of landowner licenses. Um, as you see, they've increased since 2013 by about uh, just under uh, 500. Again, some stats with regards to species, the total licenses that we issue by residency, and then how many are actual landowner licenses. And then the percentage of total licenses issued to landowners. Again, that fall turkey, by then, a lot of those are in the fall. Most of them are general licenses. So again, we don't issue general landowner licenses since they're not limited by a percentage of the quota or anything. And then here's the some basic percentages on uh, specific hunt areas that have high demand for, for landowner licenses. You see that uh, 123 type one, which is just south of Gillette here, uh, has a very high landowner license demand issuance. Mr. President? Yes. <clears throat> Scott, do we have any special permit deer areas or elk areas where the landowner permits totally consume the license allocation for that area? I believe we do not. We have some that are very close. As you look in that 123 type one, 75 percent of those go to landowners. That's the highest percentage. Well, I guess area two type one, 86 percent. So they're close. And that's one of the concerns that if you know, especially if we were to change, especially some of those late season limited very small quota deer areas, you know, Dubois, for example, if we were to, uh, that's in a general area, if we allowed that to go to landowner, there's a good probability that a lot of those would be issued in the landowner drawing. That'd be sacrilegious. <laughs> well, Gene's got it. Okay. So Gene pointed out, I was not aware of this, in 2014, there are uh, 87 type one there was two landowner applicants that did not draw because the demand was higher than the license applications, but that was back in 2014. So I'm guessing that, that that's the only time that's happened. I imagine that quota has probably been increased to address that concern and, and address deer issues. Scott, there's been a few other times in the past when that's happened. You know, raw hide one, when raw hide was first established. But not in the recent history. That's right. But again, with increasing elk populations and things like that, you know, we, we haven't had to deal with that. So again, here's uh, another stat that with the um, uh, Handicapped Hunter Program, Disabled Veteran Program, a lot of landowners are donating those licenses to that program. Here's an example of, of what's going, going on there. And we don't have the 17 uh, figures yet because uh, we're, that program is still ongoing with those, those donations.
So that's kind of a quick overview of you know how we do things, why we do things, and the reasons why we do things regarding the landowner licenses. If I made anything, uh, need any additional clarification or have any questions, I can sure provide answers. Any questions for Scott? I have one. Yeah. So on the uh, the landowner license that are donated to the uh, veterans mm -hmm. or the wheelchair program, how does that process work? What do they do? Basically, whether it's a landowner or any public can just turn their license into the department, fill out the proper form, and that comes back to the department for reissuance through a, through a, a program that, that uh, is designated to providing hunting opportunities to disabled veterans. The and biggest then, one in Wyoming is probably Hunting with Heroes. Hunting with Heroes. Okay. Yeah, they they, they uh, actively get landowner licenses for their program. And then do those those potential hunters uh, get in touch with the, with the respective landowner then for... And the, well, hunting it was the, the hunting with heroes ones. Um, yeah. They totally line out the hunt, and they may not even be hunting on that landowner's property, but they'll be within. They have to be in that hunt area. So, but hunting and heroes does all the legwork on that. Basically, once the license is donated to the program and reissued back to the hunter, they can pretty hunt pretty much hunt where they want as long as it's within in that, that license type in that area. Okay. And they may not even hunt on private land. They can hunt public land. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think Mark. Mark? Sure it's would, do we get a hold of them, or do they just keep in constant contact with you, Gene? Like, if you get a, those licenses, do you call them, or do they just check with you every once in a while and see how many licenses you have, like hunting with arrows or the physically challenged? President Holder, Commissioner Anselmi, um, the um, individuals that donate those licenses, are, um, if they can designate they want them to go to a specific organization, then the license section is in constant contact with that organization. If they don't designate an organization, it's posted on our department website, oh. and it's available for any organization to um, obtain. Thank you. Okay, Mr. President. Yep. Okay, then. Well, I'm back on the uh, issuance and drawing. Sure. I guess I've been contacted by a landowner that would like to be able to get the additional type three tag instead of the general. So is this statute the way it's done? Um, do we have any options to work on it? His deal is he'd just rather have the type three and if it's not changed so he can't get his landowner tag as a type three, he just won't allow hunting. So I said I would, you know, I'll try to see. I don't know if we can change it or not. Yeah. Commissioner President Culver, Commissioner Bird. So this is regulatory. Um, this this regulation has been in effect this way for years. We we uh, polled our wildlife supervisors to get input, and they support the way it is written. But that doesn't mean we can look at it. Just that uh, that could have some trickle down effect to go outside of whitetails and include deer and elk and some of those um, limited quota species with limited quota licenses within a general area. And so that's one consideration. As I said earlier, there could be a pretty high demand for those. Because it's my understanding that he didn't want extra tags, you know, just instead of having, how would I put that? Maybe he would like to have the choice right. of any available on his property, which one he got for a landowner's tag. And I don't know how many other landowners that would affect. I, you know. Or if it's a big problem. We have, you know, in my last, 10 or 15 years, we had one other landowner that brought this to our attention, and we went through this with him over the uh, how we issue licenses and the fairness to those that don't get landowner licenses, and everybody gets at least one license. And so uh, since that issue, we've had nobody else that I'm aware of bring it up, and our supervisors have not heard anybody bring this issue up as well. Yeah, I wasn't. I know he's not, you know, happy about it and just probably will affect hunting for possibly 20 hunters said what he normally lets in and so I obviously he can hunt white-tailed deer on his general license in that time frame but he obviously wants that November time frame the longer time yeah, frame that's outside that Definitely. general license mm -hmm. Mark as you call them and so then if you don't allow hunting then you're not eligible to get the damage payments is that right in a broadest sense that's correct you have to weigh I guess the landowner would have to weigh his decision. Yeah. And the landowner that 
where uh, Commissioner Bird's talking about, you know, they've never put in for damage and they they have loud access. They probably have damage. Uh, they've never claimed it. <laughs> Mr. President. Yes, Pat. So I guess just, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to condone a, any any person saying, you know, if I don't get my way, it's it's the highway. That's that's a pretty silly way to approach the commission, unfortunately. But it sounds like you did. But, um, you know, we we issue additional any whitetail license type three, right? So it's it's the one of the it's the only exception I'm aware of where you can kill two buck deer in Wyoming, right? That's correct. You're allowed. Um, you're only allowed to kill one mule deer. You can't one mule deer buck, but you couldn't. You can kill up to two whitetail bucks if you have the proper licenses. So if if a landowner, you know, instead of wanting to hunt during the general season, wants to hunt in the late season for a whitetail, which we're trying to control by the issuance of Type Three licenses, it seems to me that you know if that doesn't horribly complicate our license system, or, or you know, that's something we could look at. But, I mean, we're, we're seeking the public to help us control having too many whitetails in areas where they've expanded. So it seems to me that if a landowner wants to get a whitetail license, if we could do that without causing a ripple effect in our other license structure or horribly complicating Jean's life and her section's life, maybe we ought to do that. But, um, you know, I do not want to do anything that affects, for instance, Area 128 in, in Dubois, who's my near and dear area, but, um, and not just for myself. You know, that's an area where you have a lot of out-of-state folks have come in and bought all the great ranches, you know, the Winchester Ranch and other ranches. Um, and we only issue 75 late season tags now, I think, in that area. It's the pre one of the primo deer areas in all of the Western United States. And if, you know, if, none of those went to resident or non-resident hunters and they all went to landowners i think that'd be that'd be a horrible result so whatever we do with these type threes i don't want to affect those rules but maybe it's something we ought to think about i don't know right and i think we should also bear in mind how liberal our landowner licensing system already is i mean if you qualify for one animal you automatically qualify for two you don't have to hunt on your own place there's there's some real problems caused by our landowner licensing system in that I know in my area you often see on real estate ads that this property qualifies for landowner licenses and I don't like to see properties bought and sold based on qualifications for a landowner elk license that's the biggie up in my country is do you qualify for elk licensing we have wealthy non-residents purchasing properties just so that they'll have their own private hunting ground basically and of course as a result of that the public is usually excluded from hunting those areas so I, I think it's important that we're aware that this landowner licensing system these have become a bit of a and I realize I'm on thin ice here but these have be become somewhat of an entitlement landowner licenses and it's causing a lot of problems and in many places elk populations are going unchecked because of that and so I think we have to move very cautiously <laughs> in making any changes to the landowner li licensing system. So, Commissioner Culver, uh, Commissioner President Culver, Commissioner uh, Crank, so on regarding you know management, obviously most of the people that get landowner licenses want to kill a buck or a bull. So from a perspective, you know, while we'll, you know, we'll, we'll remove whitetails, it's obviously isn't the reproduction segment that, that would really do the controlling the population, but you know, it does, it right. does you know, keep them keep them somewhat in check. But, you know, I think if, you know, with this change, I have to look at the drawing odds, but I think it'd be a pretty good increase in demand. And, and um, I know some of these areas is, is license is really getting a high demand as, you know, we kind of maintain or slightly increase these numbers that there could be a point as I stated earlier that, you know, the amount of licenses available, especially for white tails, will become probably less and less. As it is the, currently the second license. And so, current process we feel you know allows everybody that opportunity to at least hunt one deer and then you know, depending on how you how you go you're given the opportunity to hunt a second deer and possibly kill two two bucks mr. president yes I used I mean I, this this very area 
used to be able to um, buy this or, or draw it or just buy it first come first served in the second draw. I mean, they was, these were left o these type threes were leftover licenses, and boy, that ended four or five years ago. There's you have to, if you want a type three license, you have to draw it. That's correct. You know, we used to in my days when I started, we used to call them a additional any whitetail deer licenses and now with the demand and the expansion of whitetails we've just made them that type three and treat them as just like a type one for better word mule deer license because of the demand and, and again the fairness issue of, of giving everybody the opportunity to have an equal chance at at least one one license outside of a general area so oh go ahead Pete. Uh, i have a landowner that complained to me because he didn't get a doe antelope license for his ranch. He uh, waited till the drawing and <coughs> did not receive one. Now he could get two landowner tags for doe antelope, could he not? Or? That's correct. Okay. You know, we do allow reduced price doe fawn cow calf licenses to be applied for as landowner licenses. And what they can apply for as landowner licenses is going to be is the same requirement as a general public, which means two in the initial drawing. And actually, we're going to make a change to Chapter 44. But if he wanted, if he wanted doe antelope tags, I know it's not a huge priority here. But if he wanted doe antelope tags, he'd have to do it through the original drawing to get. He to could get apply it. through the landowner license drawing and and get, and get those. I'm, as, I'm assuming there, there wouldn't have to be an issue with total quota and, and stuff in that because they're, like I said, they come off very very first right off the top. So, yes. In regards to your comment, in defense of. Uh, the landowner licenses, and I, I, I get squawks over. There's one area down by us that 50% are taken up for elk, but uh, we don't want to go down the road like Colorado. I've hunted in Colorado where they got the hunting for whatever. The landowners get the licenses and sell them. And I can tell you the quality of the elk isn't, you know, they, uh, hunting for, for wildlife or something. They get the landowners so many licenses that they can resell, and we sure don't want to go down down that road. I agree with you, Mark. Uh, we do not we do not want to go down the road of transferable licenses. I've certainly talked to commissioners from other states and, that already have that, and they said, if you don't do it now, don't do it. They said it, it takes up a tremendous amount of their time and resources just trying to patrol that. I guess I wanted to say that although I, I know the reasoning behind landowner licenses it is well-intentioned, and, and it's worked pretty well in most areas, that there are also drawbacks. I mean, even with some of our resident landowners, I see hunter access limited because they won't allow hunters on until they've harvested their two big bulls. And oftentimes, you know, that, that precludes any other hunters from being on those properties and the elk population is burgeoning and uh, it's causing issues and i know like in the area i live it's it's over a third of the licenses go to uh landowners you know and so it's just a different i just wanted to show there's two sides to the issue it's, it's difficult and and especially if we try to liberalize it more we're going to run into more difficulties in my opinion but you know, any change would require, you know, Chapter 44 modifications, public input process, and commission approval if, if the commission so desires to look at this or let it lie. So we're a little behind schedule. So does the commission want to look farther into this or? No. <laughs> Do you have any idea how many people it would affect? I mean, I had no idea. You think it would be a big trickle down? theory because from my viewpoint you know he's tried to draw wasn't successful that way just from me looking at it it's like well he's still just getting one landowner tag but I don't know if that's a major issue with a lot of others uh, Commissioner Bird, I, I don't you know you'd have to, we'd have to it'd be a really wild guess if, if people would switch from putting in for their I'm mean, just say mule deer license, uh, any deer license to a white tail only license. I don't know what people's preference would be. I would assume, and this is just kind of thinking out loud here, is that if you um, were allowed to apply for that white tail license and guaranteed that, as stated earlier, and then pick up a general deer license, you're getting the best of both worlds. So people that meet the qualifications for white tail uh, landowner licenses 
and have that general season license as well, you know, they would have the best of both worlds. So there, there could be a pretty high demand um, for those licenses as landowner licenses because they, they gain gain versus, you know, having to possibly not have two licenses. Scott, thank you very much. I guess uh, at this time the, the commission will take no action on this. Is that correct? What do we do? Okay, thank you, Scott. Might be something we revisit in the future. Sure. Um, Rennie, would you approach us? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, commissioners, uh, really quickly wanted to take the opportunity to uh, bring up Nephi Cole from the governor's office. He uh, drove up here to join us to talk to you uh, real briefly about the governor's shooting sports initiative. And this launched about a year ago and was something that Game and Fish has supported because of that, um, that connection that we have to the shooting sports in, in gaining so much revenue from um, the sale of, of, of guns, ammo, and also then the boating equipment and fishing equipment on the uh, Dingle Johnson side. But um, we were just hearing some very interesting things, uh, those of us at the AFWA conference, about how, how many shooters we have these days who don't hunt anymore. So we're seeing a huge contribution to wildlife management from folks who don't hunt. And so you, you invested um, in the last two budgets in the shooting sports and public ranges. Um, this last year, with the work of Tristana Bickford, uh, we were able to help out and get some uh, money out to some public ranges, uh, namely the Rollins City Range is a really uh, great range that's a uh, public range and they've got really good infrastructure and uh, also are, are very supportive of hunter education. And so now we're looking ahead to this year and, and uh, see some good projects possibly on the horizon there. But I want to bring up Nephi. Um, uh, he wanted to just chat with you real briefly um, as he's the governor's policy advisor and has been working on the shooting sports initiative. So Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome, Nephi. I want to, while he's coming up here, I want to point out that in a previous life, I worked with Nephi, but I haven't seen you for, I don't know, 10 years now, probably. Welcome well, it's, today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, thank you, Keith, uh, Commissioner. I very much appreciate the opportunity. And interestingly enough, I uh, know most of the members of the commission from other lives, uh, <laughs> playing ball with Pete, or uh, uh, I also worked with uh, Commissioner Bird's daughter this summer. And it's, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Schmidt and I share a good friend in Rourke, Denver. And so uh, while I, I, I don't know all of you personally, it's, it's been a pleasure to uh, see you guys work and, and sincerely appreciate the sacrifices that you all make to work on this committee. I know it's a lot of work. I know that, uh, you know, there are a lot of committees that uh, are simply, you know, a nice nameplate that you get. That's not the case with the Game and Fish Commission. You guys really do, you know, earn your per diem. So um, thank you very, very, very much. So, um, you know, I, I think most of you don't uh, know me very well. I think a lot of you know uh, David Wilms from our office. He does most of our, our wildlife work. And of course, he's led the national effort to reform the Endangered Species Act. Um, but uh, I happen to work on the governor's firearms related initiatives. And so uh, Second Amendment type issues, things like that, are, are uh, th that falls right into my bailiwick. And so, you know, I asked Rennie if I could come. And first of all, thank you guys for the support that you have given to Game and Fish and in the support of the department on the efforts that we've been doing to increase the shooting sports. And so um, whether it's uh, the director and his work directly, uh, Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Nesbick, um, specifically I'm biased, but Rennie and Rebecca have been fantastic. And of course we knew them before. Um, so I just really appreciate all the work that they've done. Um, I did want to share, you know, the reason I'm here is to talk about the shooting sports. And uh, and I and most of us, I'm passionate about hunting and fishing. Um, but uh, a statement for those that don't know, I think it's very important that everyone recognizes that if you're passionate about wildlife, you should be passionate about the shooting sports. And uh, the reason is this, and so I'll, I'll talk briefly about the the, uh, the a match that we held this year called the Magpul Governors Match, and there's the First year that we've we've done this initiative, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't immediately thank uh, Commissioner Culver, who the uh, individual who won the Magpul Governors Match um, will uh, uh, Commissioner Culver uh, made sure that that individual had uh, had a voice in deciding where his commissioner tag next year would go, and it sounds like that's going to go to the Cody Firearms Museum, and uh, 
uh, and uh, County Commissioner Lee Livingston packaged a fully guided outfitted elk hunt with that tag so that that can then be used to cement and, and, and further our firearms culture in the state. And so it was very generous and I sincerely appreciate your being on, you know, it, it's, it was extremely unique for the 150 competitors who showed up to, to, to see that. Basically, the, the winner was able to not only have, you know, get a prize off the prize table, but do something for the future of, uh, of uh, the firearms industry. So there were 150 participants at this match. The average gear cost for a participant at this match, it was a two-gun match, was $2,300. The average age of the firearms being used, so $2,300, the average age is three years. These folks go through guns at least once every three years. They're buying a brand new handgun. And this is on the cheap side. Uh, there were you know, $6,000 handguns and $5,000 rifles were very commonplace at a match like this, 150 participants. Um, so on the, on the low side, that's $345,000 worth of gear for these 150 participants. The PR dollar of that Pittman-Robertson funds is $35,000 in the average year. The rounds fired at the, ranch were, at the match were 45,000 rounds of ammunition, or about 1,000 Pittman-Robertson dollars. Most survey respondents planned to shoot 10, so we did a, a survey of the individuals who came to the match. They're gonna shoot from 10 to 20 matches in 2018. So let's go with the lower number of that 10. That's 1,500 matches shot for a value of $10,000 in ammunition and $12,000 in gear bought. That's the Pittman-Robertson value of those 150 folks uh, participating in the shooting sports. Most competitive three-gun shooters will shoot roughly five thousands of round per year, including practice. Our 150 shooters, that means they'll shoot about three quarters of a million rounds or $15,000 at the low end of cost in PR dollars for those 150 shooters. If those same 150 individuals bought an elk tag this year, that'd be $7,800 worth of elk tags. If they all bought an elk rifle every three years, like they buy their other rifles, they, that's about $5,000 in PR dollars from a $1,000 elk rifle that they would uh, be purchasing. If they go to the range and put 100 rounds down range every year, that's about $750. And so if we looked at that, a single hunter, so if we could look at this and break it down now from our group to a single hunter, that means in a given year, you're gonna see about $90 per person average in PR dollars from the participation of that single individual hunting elk. Now, if we get that person to be a sport shooter, that adds $180 per person per year from that individual, PR dollars coming to the state. If we can get them to do both, for each one of those participants, that's $270 per year. So it's more than triple you know, the amount of money that comes in, and this is why we should care, more than triple the amount of money that comes in in PR dollars that goes directly into conservation of, of wildlife and wildlife habitat. So whether or not they know it, and they don't know it, most of those folks, a lot of those folks, don't, they, they never put the pieces together. They don't know what PR dollars do. They just like to play. They like to go to the range. But they are literally doing, uh, you know, they're doing a service for those of us who care so much about these animals. So that's why shooting sports is important. So Governor Meade knew all these things when we developed, our, we, we were visited by Game and Fish, and the NRA and the local, you know, our state NRA deserves a huge amount of credit for this. And, uh, and if Dave Manzer came and visited with Rennie and they visited with us and said, we need to get more people out shooting. And we couldn't agree more in our office. So we, we developed three initiatives. One of them is called the Open Ranges Initiative. And the idea is if you want people to actually be getting better at shooting, to be participating and developing a community of safety, a community of competence, you gotta have a place for them to go. And so shooting ranges provide that. They're more than just a place to hang a target. They're a place where people build friendships, where they swap stories, where they talk each other into buying the new rifle, where they, where they, they make that next step. And so that's why shooting ranges you know, are primarily important. They are the foundation, they're the location where if we want a next generation of hunters and a next generation of shooting sports advocates, we need to have places where they go shoot. And it's, and it's, it's about more than just where they shoot the first time or they, they, they get that hunter safety. It's about getting people out shooting on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis, improving their skill set in the field. So in addition to the Open Ranges Initiative, which um, we have some folks who are working on some of those, those opportunities to build ranges. As Randy mentioned, we have some that have gone in and we have some more that we think we're gonna get. 
with the assistance of, of, of yourselves, thank you very much, but also of, of the, the NRA. We also developed two other initiatives. First, we did the, the governor's top 100, and Game and Fish has been huge on this, which is they hosted a website and the rule set for this. And what the, the top 100 is, is it is a statewide postal match where people use a 30 round magazine in a, in, a, in, a, in a rifle, or they can use a bolt action rifle with 10 rounds or a handgun, and they shoot a course of fire for a score, and then we, we pull all those scores in, they enter them online, and at the end of the year, Game and Fish will send the top 100 people a patch. It says, congratulations, you remember the top 100. The real purpose of this in the top 100 is really just to get people to the range, to get them going to the range at lunch with their buddies and, and getting better at those skill sets. So the next initiative that we worked on, so this would be the final initiative, was the Magpul Governor's Match. So the idea of the governor's match is to highlight Wyoming as being a, a, a the bastion of, of a firearms industry friendly state. And so we wanted to have a national level match where we brought people in and, uh, and, and showcased our state. On, and of these 150 competitors, we had the top 10 shooters in the world with us. And for a first time match, it was very impressive. And we learned a lot of things that we can do better. And we're gonna host that match again in 2018, we think we're probably gonna about double the size. And uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to get those folks here. And interestingly enough, um, we t of those top 10 shooters in the world, including Jerry Michalik and the, the Yackley family, we uh, got them out and, and uh, into the countryside and, and uh, dabbled with some wildlife. And they absolutely had a blast. Um, some of them are, are certainly coming back and they're asking questions, all the right questions about how am I going to elk hunt in Wyoming? And so uh, it's been a, a great opportunity, and uh, we're, we're very happy to be involved in it. It's been really a pleasure for me. It's been a, a guilty pleasure to be able to work on this issue. And uh, I just wanted to express uh, my sincerest thanks to the commission and to the department um, for all the work that, that you guys do on this and for all the work that they've done in supporting this effort. And so um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But mostly I just wanted to say thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nephi. Questions? Mr. President, uh, is the governor's office doing anything with 4-H groups? Not at this time. And so, I'd, really, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that. I mean, I was amazed. Mr. Talbot convinced me to give a, a tag last year to the Albany County 4-H group. But when I inquired about that, I mean, that, was, that involved 120 kids, I think. So those, those kind of organizations. And they shoot all different kinds of guns, and they're... They're really involved. I mean, it's like this young Upton's young gun group that Commissioner Culver and Commissioner Doobie helped out. Those 4-H groups really, really touch a lot of kids. So, Mr. might Mr. be something you might look Commissioner at. Commissioner Crank, I uh, I appreciate that. And we have had some conversations with them, but we haven't had an opportunity to get with some yet. I will uh, I will very much look to make sure that we can get that opportunity for the governor. Thank you. Thank you, Nephi, for coming today. We, uh, as a commission, we I think have been remiss in not asking you to address us sooner on this. Sure appreciate your attendance here today. Mr. President, I'd yes. like to make one comment to you, um, in relation to what Pat just said, that 4-H shooting sports group is the largest portion of the state 4-H group right now. It has the mm -hmm. most participants. It's, it's really, really big, so I think yeah. it'd be a great connection for you. I appreciate that, and I would note that we, we have been working with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. There are some very unique opportunities um, through that for, uh, for youth shooting sports in schools. And not a lot of people are aware of that, but traps, trap, uh, steel pistol, uh, skeet, um, they have a great national program and we're, we're kind of, we, we have been looking at how we can kind of crack that nut and, and get more involved in that. So there's some, there's some fantastic opportunities out there in the upcoming year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gene. President Culver, members of the commission, and Director Talbot. Um, this is uh, agenda item number six, chapter 44. And on chapter 44, you as a commission will normally see um, this regulation before you um, every year in July and in um, September. And in July, it's normally for the changes that were made to the legislative section that would be 
effective immediately um, when they were signed by the governor. And in September, it's those items that were effective um, in the next upcoming season, beginning in January the 1st, and any other changes that are requested by the department. You may recall that you did not see Chapter 44 in July, but you saw it earlier um, in April. And we, um, Jennifer Doring, the license section manager, brought the regulation to you in, in April so that we could get authority to conduct the leftover draw this year. So we had that opportunity, and it was a very successful change um, that we made um, in, by the commission. We had um, over 15,000 applications in that five-day pe uh, five period and issued about 11,500 licenses. So it was very successful, and we appreciate that opportunity this year to um, have that um, as a way to al allocate licenses in a more equitable fashion this year. So um, for this particular um, regulation change today, there are some changes that were um, enacted through the legislative session that are effective in January. You'll see in the changes proposed today. And the other specific changes are preference point average um, that's used in the drawing for party applications, landowner license um, applications. We have a proposed change in what's authorized to submit for a landowner, the fee charge for preference points for non-residents, and then also um, establishing a specific deadline for individuals to submit their uh, license reservations from one year to the next calendar year. So it's four um, simple changes. Um, it's not a lot of detail today. And the first um, issue to discuss is the preference point average for party applicants. So as you know, the preference points um, are in existence for non-residents and residents for moose, sheep, and goat have been in existence since the early 90s. And moose and sheep do not have party applications. So this specific change is related to non-resident elk, deer, and antelope. And the preference points for um, non-resident elk, deer, and antelope was established in um, about 2005. 2006 was the first year we had a drawing in which preference points were used to allocate licenses for um, non-residents. And the issue um, that we're trying to address today is really a technology issue. Um, so what happens on a party application is that you can have up to six members can apply together in a party. And what happens on the allocation of licenses related to preference points is you look at all of the individual values of each applicant's preference point, and we average that out for an average preference point value in consideration of license allocation. And currently, the regulation says we will average that out and round it out to five decimal places. And the technology issue is that the program we're using um, doesn't recognize that many decimals. It only recognizes up to four decimals. And it has never been a problem in the past because this is the first year we had 11 preference points for um, elk, deer, and antelope. And so if you were to use an individual that had um, 11 points, 10 points, and nine points and average that out, um, the last fifth character was not considered in the drawing. So we had an issue with the draw this year in relation to a couple of individuals that their points were not properly considered in allocation of licenses. So we'd like to um, make a change to our regulatory requirements to just go out four decimal places um, in order to um, properly use the technology of Microsoft that's used for the programming um, of our systems. And I can just give you, a, I gave you a little chart here so you could illustrate what does that look like in terms of how licenses are allocated in relation to preference points. And you can see that the first group of three individuals, they have an average of six preference points and they have, if you look at the random number one column, they all are allocated the same exact random number and that's how a party application works, is that when we assign random numbers, every person in the party has the same random number. And our applicants are ranked um, for the preference point draw by the highest point value to the lowest point value. And then within, e within each of those point values, they're ranked from the lowest random number to the highest random number. And so we're just trying to address an issue in terms of how that point average is used um, for the draw. Just a, an illustration for you. Any questions on the preference point issue in terms of the, how the computer handles that number? Okay, the second um, change then is related to landowner licenses. And as you um, heard from um, Scott Edberg's presentation, um, currently um, each landowner is authorized two licenses. And specifically to the question that Commissioner Doobie asked, currently uh, a landowner can have one full price license and one reduced price license. 
And so this proposed change is um, allowing a landowner to have an option of either having one full price and one reduced price or to have two reduced price licenses. And that would be applicable for deer and antelope. So this change is um, having an opportunity for those landowners that wanted to get two full price licenses and, and no, um, they wanted two reduced price and no full price license. And of course that doesn't apply for elk because the limit is one full price and one reduced price. And we started in 2012 offering um, non-residents or residents and non-residents the ability to have a reduced price license as a um, landowner license. That was in 2012. And then of course um, the other opportunity is uh, spring turkey licenses and fall turkey licenses for landowners. So this um, is stating that a landowner can have one spring and one fall um, turkey license per landowner applicant. A landowner family can have two spring and two fall turkey licenses, but one individual can only have one of each in each season. So we're changing the specific language throughout the regulation then to be, to be spe specific in that there's a maximum of two licenses for antelope, deer, and elk um, that's allowed to landowner applicants regardless of the number of land holdings and Scott Edberg just explained that too in his presentation. And this is just a chart which you've already seen um, identifying the number of actual licenses issued um, per species for elk, deer, and antelope for landowners, uh, full price and reduced price, and what percent of those licenses that are landowners are out of the total license allocation. So this is the chart for residents, and you saw all this data from also Scott's presentation and then non-resident allocation. And the third change um, being proposed in this regulation today is the um, fee that we're charging for non-residents for their preference points. And so I'd like to talk just a little bit about the, um, how the fees are established for preference points and what's offered in terms of preference points for drawings. And as you know, um, there's preference points for moose and sheep for resident and non-resident, and there's preference points for non-residents for elk, deer, and antelope. And this specific language on this section of the regulation is addressing drawings. And so this is also related to moose and bighorn sheep. And so what happens, um, and this statutory provision um, was established um, back in the 90s in terms of moose and sheep. And what happens is the state statute identifies the specific price that a resident will pay for uh, preference points, and that price is $7. That's a statutory fee. Um, and in the non-residents, the this legislature provides through statute, it gives the commission the authority to establish the fee to charge non-residents for their preference points. And in the past, um, that particular um, language gave the parameter of the commission to charge for moose and sheep um, up to $100 for the preference point fee. And in this last legislative session, that change um, raised the ceiling up to $150 for the price of a preference point for moose and sheep. And so the proposal in the regulation is to change um, the price for moose to $77, and that was from $75, a, pri a price change of $2. And then for a bighorn sheep, um, the price would be proposed at $103, and it was previously $100. So a change of uh, $3. Mr. President, Pat, did you say we had the discretion to raise it up to $150? Mr. President, Commissioner Crank, that is correct. The uh, statutory authority um, gives a ceiling um, of what you can charge up to for per species. And um, so your next question is probably why did we just only change it for two dollars or three dollars? Mind reader. <laughs> yeah. And so um, what what happened during this last legislative session when we were um, uh, requesting or working with a um, JAC to modify our price structure to recover the cost of our loss of general fund dollars, what the department did on um, working with the legislature is we looked at um, comparative prices across other states, um, western states. And we wanted to come up with a ratio that was reasonable on what other states charge for licenses. And so we first um, addressed changing the non-resident elk, deer, and antelope um, prices 
to be commensurate with this, uh, a similar ratio in terms of what other states charged. And so um, other states ranged anywhere from three to one um, up to a high of 43 to one. And the kind of the medium of that was around six to one or 13 to one. So we changed the proposal. We changed the prices for elk, deer, and antelope for non-residents to be 12.5 um, to one for elk and 9.3 to one for deer and antelope. So we made that change first. And then we looked at the prices for our trophy game, uh, or big game as in terms of like moose and sheep and wild bison. And those were a little bit higher ratios. So we made those price adjustments. So we targeted those first. And then we looked at the price for residents and we kind of made a um, across the board price change of 3% for the resident price. Then we did an analysis of where did that get us and we made some small adjustments in other prices um, to get up to that total of dollars that we're asking for for the loss of our general fund dollars. So we targeted those other license prices first, and we needed just to change a few others by a small percentage. And so that's how we only changed the preference point fees by a couple dollars to meet that target. So these, if a non-resident applies for a bighorn sheep license, we get to keep, if I understand this, 100 and under this proposal, $103 of their total application fee. President Culver, Commissioner Crank, that is correct. Um, there's a distinction on how the department handles um, the price of a preference point for moose and sheep between residents and non-residents. On a non-resident, we will retain the preference point fee from the refund we give them for unsuccessful license fee. A resident is not charged for their preference point when they apply for a moose and sheep license in the drawing. They earn a point and we re give the full refund back for the resident. Okay. I'm gonna, one more question, Mr. President. I mean, yes. I know on sheep, we're probably the most liberal state. We give 25% of our tags to non-residents. How many, how many on moose, how many percentage do we give to non-residents? Do you know, or does the wildlife know? You're saying in terms of licenses um, allocated? To non-residents. Okay. Um, the moose um, quota split is 80% um, goes to residents and 20% goes to non-residents. And then sheep, am I right, at 75-25? That's correct. Okay, oh, thank you. That's goats. all I have, Mr. President. Goats. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first distinction is this language is specifically for <laughs> applying in the drawing and how much the um, price will be charged to a resident for an unsuccessful um, <laughs> license. As all of you know, there's also an opportunity for a customer, if they don't apply in an annual uh, year drawing, they have the opportunity to purchase a preference point. And the purchase um, of a point occurs between July 1st and August the 31st. The commission extended that date um, a couple years ago to add one more month to that time frame. So the language in the regulation then also has to be changed to say if you're buying a point during the purchase only period <coughs> we need to also charge the same fees for those um, preference points and just um, for interest if you'd like to know we award about 4,000 um, points in the non-resident draw for moose and sheep and we purchase points of about 13,500 um, applicants um, that haven't applied in the drawing so far more people buy a point and build those points than what submit applications in the draw. Mr. For, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President uh, can you give me the 13,000 people buy preference points for <coughs> moose and sheep? That's correct. For non-residents. For Jeez, residents. For both moose and sheep? Um, for moose, it's 7,727 mm. point purchases. For bighorn sheep, that's 5,834 points purchased. So we have, we have a lot of applicants during that purchase only period buying points. And it's, real, it's kind of about the same for residents. For residents, we um, have about 14,400 points awarded from unsuccessful applicants and 12,000 points are purchased in the, on the purchase only period. And that's probably people that just forget to apply for the drawing or whatever, but um, that's the statistics on that. Then the next section in the regulation is specifically, again, related to non-residents for their elk, deer, and antelope um, points. And so again, there's a section for unsuccessful applicants versus point purchased. And the again, in uh, this legislature, gave the commission the authority to set the fee for non-residents on what we charge for those preference points. 
and that was initially established at $50 per species, and this last session it was changed up to a ceiling of $75 per species. And so currently an elk um, is $50, um, and this being changed to $52, and the deer is $40, and a change of $41, and antelope 30, a change to 31. So all those are nominal changes for um, those preference points. And there was no change being proposed to what we charge a youth for their preference points. So that's the change in relation to someone who's unsuccessful. Um, they, if they submit at the time they apply, the, the cost of the preference point, and they don't draw their first choice license, then we will award them a point for that fee that's been submitted. It is rather confusing. We talked, Commissioner Dubie and I talked about this yesterday. A lot of non-residents, when they add that point price to their application, they think that they're getting that point in the current year drawing, and it's not. It's for the next year's drawing. They're just paying the price up front if they don't um, draw their first choice license. And the second um, paragraph is related to then the point purchases. And so again, that's just to change the price so it's consistent if you buy a point during the July 1 to October 31 <laughs> period. And for statistics, if you'd like to know this, um, for the 2016 drawing for non-resident elk, deer, and antelope, there was 27,476 non-residents that paid the price up front when they applied and were awarded points. Um, the point purchase um, last year was 126,779 people bought points um, during that time frame for the next year drawing. So it's definitely a successful program. And as you know, um, if you don't keep your points current, um, you have a two-year period. And if you don't keep those points current, um, by statute, we will um, remove your points and you are considered a first-year applicant. And last year, we, we deactivated over 30,000 preference points for customers that didn't um, retain those points. And those are not very friendly phone calls to handle. <laughs> and uh, our license section and also Rennie, Rennie's group, we do a really good job of trying to inform those people that you're in jeopardy of losing your points. Um, we used to send out about 17,000 letters to customers. And now through the email efforts, we send out only about 5,000 letters because we can email customers um, about that issue. And so back to you, um, Commissioner um, Crank's ask, um, question regarding the price. This is the data that our um, Chief Fiscal Officer, Meredith Wood, put together for the legislative session to identify how much money um, that was going to be in addition um, for our operating for the increase in the price of preference points. So you can see that in 2015, the total dollars were 6.4 million, and with this price change, um, it would be an additional $210,000 if the numbers remain constant. And um, if you're kind of wondering about the resident in terms of us not charging the resident the fee, um, we, would, we, we would have an additional $105,000 if we charge residents for their preference point fee, which we do not. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay. The last topic then is the reservation of a full price license. So as you know, um, we have the opportunity if someone has um, a reason that they're unable to use their license for a good cause, and Chapter 44 defines good cause as medical issues, um, as a military transfer um, of orders, on, uh, if the area is closed and unable to hunt, there's specific reasons why um, a license you would be designated as unable to use your license as good cause. If you qualify for that unable to use as good cause, then and you submitted the proper paperwork and your license within the time frames required, then we will carry over your license to the next hunting season. And during the last legislative session uh, two years ago, um, the department was given the authority um, to charge a $10 administrative fee for that process of reissuing that license. And that happened at the time when the legislature also expanded um, what license types you could carry over. Previously, it was just a bighorn sheep and a moose license, and now you can carry over a full price limited quota um, big game uh, license. So um, what happened is we want to make sure this change is specifically being added so we can guarantee that the license that you've got from last year to carry over to this year, it's issued 
before we conduct our June draws. We want to make sure that we're um, preventing an applicant from getting a carryover license from last year and also being eligible and participate in our limited quota drawing during the current year. So we're asking um, a change that you would have to submit your paperwork by May 15th to get that carryover license issued so we can get those licenses entered and issued and in our ELS system before the draws are conducted to kick somebody out if they were um, ineligible to apply for the license. And I just gave you a chart to show you um, previous to the 2015 legislative change when it was just moose, sheep, and um, goat for carryover. There really hasn't been a dramatic increase, even though it was expanded to offer elk, deer, and antelope licenses for carryover. And for this regulation change, we, Jennifer Doring and I, conducted one public meeting in Cheyenne, and there was no one that attended the meeting. Um, but there were some comments received online and also written comments. So I'd like to go through those comments. The first comment um, was received from a gentleman in Casper, and he um, is a resident, and he is in favor of the non-resident preference point fee. Um, but he had some concerns about some difficulty in drawing the license, and he would like to see some kind of a waiting period um, or something that can be done to see if uh, there could be uh, some way if you draw, you have to wait a few years before you can draw again. Right. And also he made a comment related to the split um, in licenses, proposing a 90-10 split. And as you know, in Doug's presentation earlier today, he went over all the splits in terms of what the quota split is for all license types in their drawing. And the thing that to note is that um, the commission has the authority to establish um, some of those quota splits, and then the statutes also authorize some splits. So through statute, the moose, bighorn sheep, and mountain goat are established by state statute, whereas the commission has the authority to change the quota splits for all other species. And I guess just also as a note to, um, note to inform you of this, um, during the 2016 legislative session, there was two bills that were proposed by Senator Hicks um, related to this, these topics. Um, he proposed a, a change in the quota split um, to 90-10 for mountain goat and wild bison, and that was not accepted um, in, uh, in terms of um, being introduced for um, action. He also proposed um, another bill related to hard to draw areas and then proposing a waiting period. And again, that was not um, something that was made it through the legislative session. So these kind of comments have certainly been um, addressed um, and pr uh, proposed through legislative action. The other um, comment was received from a gentleman from um, <coughs> Pennsylvania. And he, um, he states that um, he doesn't mind a license price change but he would like to see more of a nominal change for both residents and non-residents. So instead of having these big increases in prices, maybe over um, having more reasonable price changes um, over a more rapid period of time. He'd like to be able to see his future um, generation hunt in our state as well. The third comment was received regarding the preference points. And this particular gentleman who's from Virginia, non-resident, He's not opposed to the price change, um, but he would like to have more flexibility in how he uses his preference points. So he's proposing that it would be um, an, an option to be able to identify um, when you use your points and maybe um, not have to use your points in a given year when you want to maybe hold your points for a hard to draw area and not have to use your points to lose your points um, when you draw for a license. And I know um, Commissioner Duby has some comments regarding that as well. <coughs> and the fourth comment um, is related to a resident. Um, he's identifying that he's questioning why are the species split 80% for residents for, for everything except for elk, and that um, he would like to see the, the draw to be 80% um, for, for elk. And as you know from what you've just heard in two different presentations, um, the resident and non-resident elk split is 84-16. So um, I think it, this kind of illustrates that our licensing systems are very complex and people don't understand how everything works or what those quotas and percentages are. So just an un uninformed um, customer not understanding what those um, rules and regulations are. And we had a couple other written comments that were submitted. This <coughs> first one was related to 
a um, someone who apparently likes to ice fish, and he feels that you should have a charge for a second pole for ice fishing and potentially a $10 fee proposal he's throwing out there. And he also submitted a comment related to the reciprocity stamp. And it, it, you may or may not know this, but we do have an opportunity where we can um, establish an agreement between Utah and our state and where we can, um, through a reciprocity stamp, we can charge a, a, an agreed upon fee, and that fee is $10, where a non-resident license holder in Utah can pay a $10 fee to our state to hunt on the Wyoming side of the Flaming Gorge. And um, he, his proposal is to eliminate um, that particular reciprocity stamp and require those individuals to buy a, a non-resident license in our state. And looking back, I just looked over the last like five years, the average reciprocity stamps is about 8,000 stamps per year we, sold, we sell. And I did a calculation, and it really is kind of um, enlightening. If you were to charge those 8,600 um, Utah individuals a daily license, that's $120,000. So that's just a difference of about $34,000 um, for license fees. If, you, if those same individuals <coughs> bought an annual license and bought the required conservation stamp, that would be about $901,000. So that is a pretty significant change if you didn't have that reciprocity stamp. So that's his recommendation is to eliminate that stamp. And that is the proposed changes and the public comment that was received. And um, President Culver, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or the commission. I do have one. Um, on this reciprocity issue with Utah, I guess I'd be interested in his comment, he indicated for every 10 Utah residents that, that fish on the Wyoming side, there's maybe one that fishes on the, one resident of Wyoming that fishes on the Utah side. But I know we've got employees here that have worked that Green River region. I'd like to hear their take on that. Is that indeed the issue? President Culver Commission. Um, it depends on what species you're talking about. Uh, for kokanee, the best fishing is on the Wyoming side. Um, for bass, mama bass, the best fishing is on the Utah side. Um, we think we've got better fishing on is the it, Wyoming side for sure. Is it in our benefit to have this reciprocity agreement? You know, if we're going to continue it, I think that the price is set too low. It's been at $10 for a long time. Um, now, Utah has approached us with the pro uh, um, prospect of uh, eliminating it for regulation simplicity. Um, and, if, and just making it so that if you have a Wyoming license, you can fish Utah without anything. And uh, same goes if you have a Utah <laughs> license, you can come to, come to Wyoming. Right. Um, <laughs> we are not supportive of that right now. And uh, um, I think that, uh, you know, we have... Uh, um, production costs that uh, if people are going to be coming into Wyoming, we think they should be paying for that uh, privilege to, to fish there. And it's an exceptional fishery. Um, you know, I think that if we're going to continue with the re reciprocity, we need to look at uh, perhaps increasing the cost or eliminating it and um, increasing license sales. Mark? They've, some people game the system. It's cheaper to go buy an out-of-state Utah license and pay ten bucks to fish in Wyoming than come to Wyoming and buy an out-of-state license. Currently, the, the if I if I'm correct, the, the Utah fishing license is seventy-five dollars for a non-resident fishing license. So they could purchase that and the ten-dollar stamp. It is cheaper. And then they could fish Wyoming. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of non-residents that we feel that are aware of that and are, are doing that right now. How do we change it? What do we do? A task force, or what do we do to, to change, <laughs> change it? <clears throat> Can we change it? Price of the Utah fishing license? No, we can't. Okay, let me ask you this. If we were to eliminate the reciprocity agreement, is that in the best interest of the agency or not? And is it enforceable? <laughs> I mean, I mean, is it going to cost us extra personnel out there to patrol? 
Well, I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, I guess my recommendation would be to uh, um, look into it further statutorily and, and uh, Gene's already crunched some numbers. We've kind of at the initial stages of this discussion, um, I guess it'd be my recommendation before we made any action that we get, get more information. And yeah, because the question wasn't answered. How many people in Wyoming buy a Utah license? I mean, that maybe we could, you'd come back to us at the next meeting. We got Wyoming people buying the reciprocity and Utah people buying to see what the, the, the numbers are. And then. Uh, yeah, we've rep we began to collect some information on violation rates, which uh, we've just got through email here uh, the last couple of days. And so we're, we're collecting that information right now on everything, so. Okay. Dirk says that we, we saw about eight times more stamps in on our side than the Utah side, so. I would like more information on this. It looks, I got to be honest, it looks like Wyoming's getting a short end of the stick on this, this agreement with Utah. So I'd like more information on that at a future time. Okay, Gene. Um, Mr. President. Yes. I'd like to expound on what uh, Gene said earlier. Um, I know we're running long here, but I'll make it quick. But I would like us to, to, to look more into the, the situation about the preference points uh, regarding uh, some type of system where you can utilize your points differently. Currently right now, if you apply for a type one license and you get it, you lose all your points. So if you have 10, 11, whatever you have, you lose them all. Um, and I, I, personally, I think that's kind of, it's, it's a harsh situation in, in a lot of areas in Wyoming where you may only need one or two or you don't need any uh, to draw a license and you lose them all. Uh, I would like to look at into a situation where you have two options. You either use none of your, license, your points or you use them all. So that you can, right now it precludes a lot of hunters who, who come to, would like to come to Wyoming to go hunting in, in, in areas of the state, but they cannot because they're, tr they're still trying to get that high sought after tag somewhere in the state, which might take seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever points it takes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, they could possibly go hunt if they decided not to use any points. They could go hunt in a wide variety of areas in the state where they don't need any points. Uh, and, and that would allow them to do that and, and still come to Wyoming, still hunt, but still save those points for that special hunt, uh, something along those lines. Uh, I, I just think it's a, it's a harsh system where you, you put all of your, your points in regardless of how many it takes. For instance, there's lots and lots of antelope areas. We're talking, obviously, we're talking non-residents. There's lots of antelope areas in this state where you don't need a preference point. You just, you know, you can go on the regular or the low side and get your license. But a lot of guys don't do that because they're they're saving their points for somewhere else. I know as an outfitter for many years, we'll have people contact us and want to go hunting, and first question or first thing they give you is, well, I have 10 deer points. I'll go, well, that's great, but in our particular area, you don't need any. So some hunt with you, some don't. And a lot of them will say, well, I don't think I want to hunt in this area because I don't want to take the chance. I don't want to lose all my points. Uh, I, I just th think it's a system that we could possibly look into to see whether, like I said, they can manage their own points. But their only two options are either they don't use any of their points or they use them all like they currently do. Um, it, it would give more options for more hunters to, do, to hunt more in Wyoming. Uh, so I'd like, I guess I'd like to throw that out there. I've talked to quite a number of both sportsmen, outfitters, lots of different people. And my original intent was that for you to manage your own points regardless. You could use one, two, whatever. Uh, most people did not agree with that. And so I modified my, my, my stance to, to the option very similar to what was presented as a, as a public comment. Now, I have talked with Gene and some of the others. And, you know, it, it obviously would require some effort, but, it, but probably not undoable uh, and, and it's, it's same thing with being a party situation uh, if there's three four five or six whatever and they'd all have to buy onto it as well you know no one could use any points uh, it, so it'd be a way for you to still hunt Wyoming uh, in a more frequent basis than if you're trying to garner points in some highly sought after area yeah. mr. president members of the Commission it would certainly be the department's uh, pleasure to provide that type of a presentation to the commission 
if you would provide more guidance and direction to us as far as uh, uh, exactly what you would like in that presentation. Um, in the last three years, we have seen a precipitous increase in the number of people interested in hunting in our state, and, and draw odds continue to diminish the number of people who are unsuccessful in the draw has, has increased fairly substantially over the last three years. And, and as we move forward with that, I would just ask the commission to keep in mind that if we complicate our license issuance process any further, uh, we, we, there are some very serious ramifications that go with that. And, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I just don't think this is that <coughs> difficult to understand. Um, but either way, yeah, I just I, I throw that out there uh, to, to see whether or not it's it's something that people are interested. If they're not, so be it. Uh, but I, I feel like it, it's it's a possibility that could, could help hunters in our state. Okay, I would uh, entertain a motion on Chapter Forty Four, Mr. President. President Colbert, I don't know if there's any public comment or not. Oh, I don't know if there is. Is there any? Uh, persons that would like to address the commission on mm -hmm. chapter 44 sorry I thought maybe Jeff wanted to say something okay with that do I hear a motion mr. president I would move that we approve chapter 44 but I, I have an amendment that I want to do after we I think that's the correct procedure, isn't it? To I, actually, I think you can do you work that right into your uh, motion right now. Okay. I move that we approve Chapter 44, and I want to um, <clears throat> make a proposed change to Section 21, Drawing Advantage for Non-Residents. Um, it says it's on page 44-40 of the proposed regulations. The proposal by the department is effect, it, it reads effective January 1, 2018, the preference point fee for non-residents shall be $103 for full price bighorn sheep and $77 for moose. Um, if I understand it, even though this was when I was laying in a hospital bed in, in Denver, Colorado, that um, the legislature authorized us to go up to $150 for both moose and bighorn sheep preference points. And so that's gonna be my amendment. <clears throat> and in, as a matter of explanation, um, you know, people who come to Wyoming to hunt moose or bighorn sheep, these are um, large part very wealthy people. I mean, you don't hunt sheep um, on a shoestring. Um, unless you're a resident and you're 16 or 18 years old. Or, so these are, these are very wealthy people. And so my proposed amendment would increase the, the preference point fee for <clears throat> bighorn sheep, $47 from what it's proposed in this regulation. And it would increase the preference point, uh, in preference point that we get to keep, preference points fee that we get to keep by $77 for moose. If I've done my math right, <clears throat> this is a potential revenue gain. I think Gene told us that there were 7,727 people bought moose preference points. Times $73 increase, that would generate an additional $564,000 for the department. Um, I think Gene told us that 5,084 people bought preference points for um, bighorn sheep, it, where the proposed amendment cre increases that by 50 bucks, so that would be an additional $254,200. That generates an additional $818,271 for the department, and that is just on people buying preference points, and it doesn't include the people that pay that fee in the drawing. So, you know, we're talking about a, a potential increase of a million dollars in revenue a year to the department um, and and these are people that you know I think we always need to be careful as a commission not to overprice ourselves but the fact that we give out 25% of our bighorn sheep tags to non-residents 
appeals to people. And these are just people that have the money to pay these fees, and I, and I think we'd be silly not to do it. And I would just note that, you know, in this proposed budget that we saw earlier today, we're spending, for instance, uh, we're scheduled to spend $110,000 on moose research, 200, about 280000 next year on moose research. I mean, these, these are for our, two of our species that, you know, there's trouble. I mean, we, we have disease problems in bighorn sheep. We have, um, I believe, predation problems with our moose herds because we have way too damn many of grizzly bears and wolves. And so I think this is a, an appropriate area for us to exercise our discretion that the legislature has given us and um, charge an additional preference point fee on non-resident folks who want to come hunt our sheep and our big our sheep and our on our moose. And so I would make that amendment to increase these to both one hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. Do I have a second? I will second that motion. David seconded that. Um, other discussion. I, I have one more question. So with the uh, Elk special management stamp and the fe the pheasant special management permit. Did the in the statute? Can you remind us? Did this legislature set those price increases, or did they give us an option of increasing them to a certain amount? President Culver, if I recall correctly, the statutory authority gives the commission to charge up to um, a, a certain price. And I believe that that changed up to fifteen dollars. Is that correct, Director Calvert? Uh, I guess you know that's one thing we've really hammered on over the last couple of years is how underpriced our pheasant special management permit and our elk special management stamp were. And given a one-time opportunity to increase those, I guess I. I would like to know the thinking of the department in suggesting that we increase those by only 50 cents. Mr. President, members of the commission, that's set statutorily. We actually are working right now with a legislator who would like to uh, give the commission the authority to set those, those fees. But currently, the reason they're going from 1250 to $15 is uh, uh, the bill that increased li licenses last year. Commission has no authority to change the, the price on special management permits at this time. Okay, so I, I, I apologize. I have read this wrong. I was comparing the wrong line. So it is going from 1250 to 15, which is the maximum statutory allowed. That's correct. Okay, I, I withdraw that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? President Culver, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I just want to make sure that there's, um, it's clear there's a distinction in what I understand um, Commissioner Crank to propose. So his proposal is only changing the price when someone purchases a preference point, not the price in which we're retaining from an unsuccessful applicant, or is this change in both paragraph I and paragraph II? I would like to change it in both, Thank both you. paragraphs. Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to repeat the motion. I think everybody understands it. I'll go ahead and call for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Um, with that, even though we're a couple of agenda items behind, we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. Um, it's my understanding that they have brought in lunch for the agency folks and the commission across the hall. And let's Try to be back here at uh, five minutes after one o'clock to resume. Thank you. So I missed out on a landowner tag. 